streaming our program for those who could not attend in person. So you can check City Channel 4's website and their YouTube site for the programs. Check Mediacom's station guide to view the presentation on Mediacom City Channel 4. Uh, you can also find a link to the video on the Master Gardener's Facebook page as well as our members only page. Uh, please try to avoid walking near or under the cameras when you exit the room. We don't want to film you ducking under the cameras because the cameras are actually wide angled. And so you're going to get caught on camera trying to get underneath it and that'll uh, be entertaining for everyone who sees it and, and shares that video. Um, a quick reminder, after a two-year interruption due to the pandemic, the JC Master Gardeners will host our annual plant sale and flea market on Saturday, May 7th from 9 a.m. to noon. So that is the day before Mother's Day in May. We're counting on Master Gardener volunteers for donations and seedling starts. So I would refer you to the Times newsletter that has information about that, as well as how to contact Emo Rindersbacher if you're able to volunteer plants or to grow seedlings for the plant sale. Um, you'll see an evaluation form for each presenter, so please complete those and return the evaluation forms for each speaker to Linda. Thank you for taking the time to attend today. Thanks go to City Channel 4 staff, Lily and Ty, for recording these presentations, to Shannon Balicki, Jackie and Alice for helping with this program. And of course, thanks go to each of our presenters today for their efforts to bring education and information to our program. I think we have a, a nice diverse set of topics for the CE today. So now I'm going to turn the mic over to Linda, and she's going to introduce each speaker. Thank you, Doug. It really is nice to see everyone here today as Doug said, with part of your faces, but we appreciate that. Um, and thank you for attending in person. I would like the project coordinators to stand, so if you're a new Master Gardener, you can see who the project coordinators are and try and make effort to uh, talk with them about their projects and how you might volunteer. So if you would just take a moment to stand up. Project coordinators, I, I know you're here. <laughs> Alice, thank you. A big hand of applause for you guys, too. In 2014, Nicole Pearson launched the local effort for Master Gardener Continuing Education. In 2019, when she moved to Wisconsin, Doug and I took on the program, so we're very excited to have this in-person program after a bit of a hiatus in 2020 and 2021. We, we came to you virtually. Our presenters will take questions after each of their presentations, and you're going to be asked to step to this microphone so, you're, um, so our viewing audience can hear your questions as well. I'm so pleased to introduce our first speaker, Tyler Baird. I met him seven years ago when he arrived in Iowa City. His contributions have sparked innovations in the park and public spaces throughout the city. His, the departure from traditional gardening designs immediately transformed the city's natural environment into a greenscape sanctuary. Urban gardening is tough. The key is selecting the right plant species that cohabit in close proximity to produce a pleasing effect. Placing importance on the plant's architectural form, structure, and texture is critical, and color adds to the diversity. Tyler's appreciation moved Iowa's natives to the forefront and redefined the character of modern urban spaces in our city. 
His strategy, inspired by nature and ecology, boosts the growing acceptance of the natural environment. His inspiration features perennials that change throughout the season, producing an effect that nature is flourishing. As the plants grow and patterns evolve, the gardens reflect constant movement, and I want my garden to look like his. <laughs> Tyler is a native Iowan. He is an Iowa State University alum who majored in landscape architecture and received his MS um, from Utah State University. He worked for the National Park Service in western U.S., before returning to his home state in 2015. Now, as superintendent of Parks and Forestry, Tyler's perennial movement design highlights the living, changing spaces advanced by legendary plant artist and nurseryman Pete Odoof. Let's welcome Tyler. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me and the, the warm welcome, um, and Linda for <laughs> everything you've done downtown to help us with this movement. Uh, I met Linda, I think the second or third day I was on the job um, in Iowa City. Um, my position at that time was uh, kind of the uh, field supervisor for the horticulture operations, and she's been a big help, and I know a lot of you help her out as well around town, either on the downtown um, projects or other places around, so we appreciate all you do as well. Let me pull up this quick. Okay. There we go. Awesome. So today we'll be talking to you about uh, um, perennial movement design, um, the role of native plants uh, in that. Um, I don't just use native plants, but native plants um, are kind of the, the ethos of this design style. Um, like Linda said, I'm superintendent of Parks and Forestry um, within the Parks and Recreation Department in Iowa City. And I've got my email address up there. If you have any questions that we don't get to or anything, I also brought some business cards. Um, you can see me after for those as well. So our objectives today um, are to identify new perennial approaches, um, discover um, perennial favorites, maybe they're new to you, um, maybe you've been using them for a while, um, and then gain tips for um, really dynamic perennial gardens, so things that are going to be dynamic the year round. Um, so I also brought up here on the front table, these were all just cut yesterday from my home garden, so you can see there's, there's plenty abundance still. Um, in the garden even at this time of year. And those are a mix of uh, probably 60% native and then 40% uh, non-native, but, but plants that work well with those. So I'm gonna ask you this now, but I'll come back to it in a little bit. I'll give you a, a, a few uh, slides to think about it. Just kind of <laughs> want you to think about your favorite perennial. I know uh, I get asked my favorite plants a lot of times. Usually it's trees I'm asked, but, uh, but perennials as well. Um, there's a long list, so just uh, uh, think about what might be your favorite, and we might uh, get some shout outs in a little bit for those. So here's a little bit of my background. I put this up here because it, uh, it helps inform the work that I do, the places I've been, the other gardens I've seen, the other uh, um, uh, coworkers I've had um, have really uh, helped me um, uh, get to where I am today. Um, so started at Iowa State, um, background in landscape architecture. Um, I worked at Ryman Gardens when I was there, beautiful gardens there. If you, uh, um, if you haven't had a chance to get there, I'm sure most of you had. Um, I highly recommend going there. I spent some time uh, during undergrad at University of Idaho as well on an exchange. Um, did grad school at Utah State. Um, super long title, um, Human Dimensions of Ecosystem Science and Management. So <laughs> I think it's the longest in their book, um, but really what that means is how people um, are using the, the spaces outdoors. Um, it was focused on outdoor recreation, kind of more so in the West there, but that can translate back to how we're using city environments or our parks as well. Um, worked for a little bit uh, with the National Park Service and Missouri State Parks, so kind of those more natural spaces, 
um, before uh, um, coming uh, back to Iowa. I grew up in Tipton, so uh, um, just real close by. Um, really love this area. So um, one of the other things that brought me back really were the native plants, the prairie. Um, I love getting out in the prairie. There's pictures from a seed harvest uh, last fall, um, just uh, not too far from here. Um, so uh, I really enjoy really the, really the colors, the textures, our native plants, the open landscape, um, just everything that's there. And like I said, I'm not the first one to do these things. Uh, we all do it a little bit differently. Um, but here's just some pictures of some others to do that. Um, Linda had mentioned uh, Pete, uh, and he's, uh, he's on the top right there. Um, so he's kind of the expert, I guess, or the one that everyone kind of looks to. Um, but there were others as well. And I'm going to focus a little bit of the first part here on that uh, um, individual in the bottom left. That's Jens Jensen. He was uh, basically he had my role a whole long time ago for the city of Chicago, so much larger scale. Um, so he was one of the first to do some of these things in the U.S. So here we see kind of what was thought of as the ideal garden. Um, what, when America started to um, make parks, um, everyone was trying to emulate um, what was in Europe. Um, so a lot of uh, um, high maintenance plants uh, spaced with formality, um, all of those things. Um, and this is one of Jens, Jensen's first gardens in Chicago, kind of his early work. And you can see it really follows kind of that, uh, that aesthetic. Um, but then he started to look, you know, right outside his door. This is a, a current picture um, in Chicago. Um, but this is what it would have looked like around the city. Probably not as many tall buildings at that time. Um, but prairies right in his backyard. So he took those, uh, those prairies and that inspiration and really started to, uh, to use that in his designs. Um, so, you know, naturalized plantings. You see here, there's, it almost looks like uh, this was, you know, you go out and find a creek through the woods. Um, so designing in those ways. Or in this, uh, this photo, um, uh, you've got kind of a meandering uh, stream with native plants and masses around them. Um, on all of the edges there. So he was one of the first to do um, really the design style, one of the first to embrace native plants, especially prairie plants. Um, so we can all thank him today for, you know, a lot of those staples we go to the, the nursery or greenhouse and, and find our, our thanks to him and promoting those. So we didn't just have um, all of the European um, plants that, that were seen as in fashion at that time. Then somewhere along the line, we, uh, we kind of shifted um, kind of mid-century um, and this uh, is a uh, award-winning garden, and there are a lot of good things about this garden. Um, this is also in Chicago by uh, uh, Dan Kiley. Um, but you see a lot more formality come in, not as many natives, even though the, the trees are native in this instance, um, but, but not a lot of variety in your, your perennials um, or your ground plane. Um, so this is one style, um, and it, it is successful. Um, but this was kind of morphed into something that we can all see here. Um, I feel like it, it led to this anyway. You know, you, you have similar spacing. Your, your trees are spaced out. Your shrubs are spaced out. Um, but I would argue this doesn't add a whole lot visually or ecologically to our landscapes. And uh, McDonald's isn't the only one to do it. Uh, Wendy's does it as well. And this is probably the best these ever looked. Freshly mulched. Uh, looks like they weren't planted too long before. Um, they probably don't look this good, you know, even a couple years down the road. Um, but I can't just pick on, on others. Uh, this is uh, at Cardigan Park in Iowa City um, after we had a redesign. And uh, um, we try to catch things in the design process. Um, uh, we don't do all the design work in-house on some of our projects, and uh, um, we, we do our best to uh, um, kind of improve them um, afterwards. But this, you can see there's some weeds in there, but uh, um, you know, plants further space apart, a bunch of mulch, uh, not a whole lot of extra interest there. So you'll see this garden again in a little bit, and hopefully you'll see the improvement. This was uh, City Hall uh, in uh, 2015, 2016, sometime around there. Um, you can see um, similar, um, just tired plantings that had been planted. You know, they probably looked good when they went in sometime in the 80s, early 90s, but uh, 
Um, they were starting to get tired and aged out and uh, just kind of dying in a sea of mulch there. Um, and you've got a uh, burning bush right behind the signs there, which I beg you all not to plant as it's uh, become invasive uh, in our area. So getting back to uh, your favorite perennial, has anyone thought of one yet? Anyone want to shout one out? Got any takers? The peonies. Peonies, okay. How about over here? Butterfly weed, awesome. Yeah. Any others? Yeah. Daylilies. Daylilies, okay. Yep. Echinacea. Coneflowers. Coneflowers, yeah, hey, we got echinacea, coneflowers, same right together. Awesome. Well, we got some good ones there, and uh, a lot of those um, uh, I'll use in my uh, my designs, um, especially some of those those natives that you said, echinacea, um, especially. Um, so my favorites all kind of get back to this, the, the prairie. Um, the grasses, um, the forbs that, that are in masses, kind of that uh, clump together or add little highlights throughout the, the prairie. Um, and they do that all year long. This is a fall, fall picture again, but, uh, but this would change throughout the seasons. Um, so getting back to Chicago today, um, if you ever want inspiration and want to see how uh, the, uh, the really uh, um, Experts that have a lot of extra um, money and, uh, and staff uh, do it. Um, you can go to Chicago. They have a, a lot of very nice gardens there. Um, this one is the Lori Garden um, in Millennium Park. It is actually on top of a parking structure. Um, so when we're talking about tough plants, these plants are growing in um, soil that's all been brought in. Um, and uh, there's, there's not a, a, a lot of extra help there. Um, You've got buildings surrounding, um, you know, uh, urban heat, heat island effect. Uh, you've got all the Chicago winter weather that, um, that's kind of crazy as well. So um, you can see if these plants are doing well here, they're probably going to do well for us in Iowa City, downtown, and the parks, but they'll also do well in, in your gardens with not as much upkeep and, and maintenance. This is also Chicago. This, uh, this is by Roy Diblick. His photo was also on one of those first slides, and he has a, a great uh, book called The No Maintenance Approach to Perennial Gardening, No with uh, K and O-W. Um, so he's another great um, resource out there, and he, uh, um, he's based out of uh, just over the line into uh, um, Wisconsin um, from the Chicagoland area. So he's also kind of that space. So you can see kind of how, how they were doing it there. Um, so now I'm going to take you through some slides that kind of show the plant material. Um, that's what I'm going to focus on um, uh, for the first part here. And I'll uh, not just include those, what you would traditionally think as perennials, like those herbaceous perennials, but I'm going to include some shrubs as well, which, um, which will work well in these plantings. So first up here, um, we have a native. We have nine bark. Um, so this one um, would be a cultivar or a native R of it. Um, the, the red color kind of tells you that. I believe this is summer wine, the variety, but there are a lot of good varieties out there. Native, it would be green, um, but, uh, but the nursery industry has, has um, you know, enhanced some of those colors. So this is a great, great native. You can't really go wrong. If you cut it down, it'll grow right back up. Um, it makes a good uh, um, screen or um, kind of highlight, uh, especially with that color in the garden. Um, so this is one that I, I use quite often. If you have a wetter location, uh, this is button bush, and you can see that, that beautiful uh, um, you know, button-shaped uh, flower on there. Um, really full of pollinators. All of those little individual um, uh, parts of the flower, um, they're, they're always um, all over that. So bees, butterflies, uh, even ants, a little bit of everything will crawl on those. So another, another good uh, plant, um, especially if you have a little bit wetter spot in your yard. Here's one of my favorites, and we got a monarch on there enjoying as well. Um, this is oak leaf hydrangea. So we're all probably familiar with the, uh, um, the uh, just typical hydrangea you'll see. But uh, I found that oak leaf's a little bit tougher um, and does a little bit better. 
um, for me. Um, I've got one right outside my office window that the birds love. The sparrows are, are in and out of it all day long, um, and uh, other birds and, and insects as well. And this will keep those flower heads throughout um, the year as well, and they change color um, as they go. And you can find short ones, medium-sized ones, really big ones. So for just about any garden, you can find one that works. This next one is arrowwood viburnum. So um, I like viburnums. They're, they're a good native um, with arrowwood. Um, you've got these, these blooms at this time of year. Um, they've got great fall color, um, and uh, they make a good screen. I've got some along my yard that are uh, kind of a screen between um, my yard and my neighbor's yard, um, but they're, uh, they're just good for um, you know, pollinators and, and habitat as well. Uh, in that same row, um, to diversify a little bit at home, I have a common witch hazel. So this is going to be a large shrub or a small tree. Um, yeah, I like the multi-stem version, um, at least in a home garden. Um, so you can see this was the last thing to bloom in the fall. Um, so this picture was probably sometime in beginning of November of last year. You have a few of the, the yellow leaves hanging on, and then you've got those, those really cool yellow flowers that some of the last pollinators that are out for the season are going to be enjoying. Uh, Fothergilla, um, this is another um, as fall. Um, you can see really great uh, fall color on this one. Um, a little bit smaller, um, maybe not quite as tough. So if you have a, a tougher location, we tried some downtown and uh, they didn't do quite as well. I think it was maybe a little too hot or dry for them, but, but in most home gardens, they would, they would do really well. Um, keep the rabbits off of them. This one did not look as good the, the year after I planted it because uh, the rabbits got to it. Another great, uh, um, great shrub that uh, adds some uh, different colors and textures throughout the season is bottle brush buckeye. So just like a buckeye, it'll get that little seed, um, or not little, but big seed with a husk around it. Um, and then you also have a, uh, a nice uh, um, white flower, like panicle flower at part of the, the season. And I believe I have it in some, um, some pictures in a little bit as well. So that's kind of the, the go-to shrubs, I would say, um, that uh, I use at home around the, the city and that I've seen done successfully in other gardens. Um, there are others as well. If you, want, uh, if you want just a good green backdrop and you have a shady spot, just a standard traditional U would work. Um, so we use some of a little bit of everything, but, th but these are really my go-tos. So if you read Roy Diblick's book or anything by, by Pete Adolf, um, you'll, you'll see sedges um, focused on a lot. And what sedges do really well, um, well, a few things. They, they cover the ground in between your plants, uh, work as a, um, like a living mulch, if you will. Um, they keep some green throughout the season. So this is a winter, um, winter photo of uh, Pennsylvania sedge. Um, but not just Pennsylvania, there are so many sedges out there. Um, you can find sedges that work in almost every type of situation. So you've got uh, anything from dry and sunny to uh, wet and shady and everything in between. So, so there's probably a sedge that works for you out there. Um, different heights, colors, textures, seed heads, all of the above. Um, Pennsylvania sedge, though, is a, a good one that grows in a lot of um, areas. So. Um, that's why I've kind of highlighted it here. Little blue stem. I've got some in the, the cuttings up here. Uh, it, it keeps a good form throughout the winter. Um, this is a fall photo. It's got a little bit of uh, red color um, in this instance with that, that white airy seed head that's really nice. So um, this is a good prairie native um, that's not too tall. Um, so if you have a, a smaller home garden, it's not going to take over or, or be the spotlight, but kind of like those sedges, it'll, it'll fill some of those spaces in between. Another good one, uh, blue grandma grass, um, uh, sort of native. Uh, <laughs> depends on what you consider native, but uh, it would be native to the U.S. Um, and this cultivar here is called blonde ambition grass. 
Um, but I found one that I like even better now called Honeycomb. Um, it just has a little bit more um, lasting power through our, our colder winters. Um, so if we get a cold year, it will do better. Um, but very nice uh, um, plant. There's some here. Um, another cultivar that I've heard of that doesn't do quite as well is called Angel's Eyelashes. So you can kind of see they, they look kind of like eyelashes. They're very whimsical and fun and have some of that movement with the wind and, and the textures um, that really add to things. Another grass here is switchgrass. So switchgrass is, is uh, um, another good, a little bit taller um, plant. Um, I tend to stick with, if I want a taller version, Northwind is the variety or cultivar. And if I want a shorter one, I'll go with Shenandoah. Shenandoah has better fall color, nice and red, um, but doesn't get as tall. Um, and the uh, uh, Northwind has really good green throughout the year and throughout the summer. But you can see even in the winter um, with snow on it, it can look really pretty, those textures playing off the, the white of the snow. Um, so those were kind of the, the go-to grasses. Other ones I'll use are um, big blue stem. Uh, some of the breeders out there are coming up with some good cultivars of those. Um, and uh, Indian grass as well. And what some of those cultivars get you um, is uh, a little less tendency to spread at times. Um, so uh, some of the um, the just straight species natives um, can tend to spread, which is great in a lot of our instances. If it's spreading around the gardens, I know it's, it's tough and hardy, and uh, um, maybe it's filling a space. There's nothing wrong with going in, digging out something you don't want in one spot and uh, dealing with it that way, dividing it up, bringing it to your plant sale, um, whatever it may be. Um, so uh, those are the grasses um, that I would recommend, um, and then we'll kind of go through some others here. So we're getting some of the, the pretty colors now. Um, my favorite genus of, uh, of plants, so if you were asking me that question, I would say allium or ornamental onion, um, common name. So this one is a, uh, a, a newer, um, uh, just younger, I, I would say, um, uh, summer beauty allium. Um, so this one is not one of the native ones, but we do have native ones out there. Um, called nodding onion, um, so uh, th they're almost, you know, the same color, um, and they'll have kind of a, a crook in the um, the stem right below the uh, the bloom, like one of these has on it. So some of those same characteristics, but a lot of good ornamental onions out there. Millennium's another great uh, cultivar. Um, they bloom uh, quite a while in the summer. Always have pollinators on them. Have that nice pink color um, as well. So here is Rattlesnake Master. Um, so why I like Rattlesnake Master is uh, above all else the form that it gives. It's got a cool name too. Um, and then uh, it's always, uh, here's another picture, it's always full of pollinators on these, uh, um, these flower heads um, throughout, uh, throughout the fall. So of, of a plant that doesn't have a really showy bright flower, it probably has the most pollinators of any others. And this is another great uh, prairie native. Um, that picture of me in the prairie that day, um, I found a bunch of these to, uh, to save some seed on as well. And someone over here uh, mentioned uh, butterfly weed. Um, a, great, uh, a great milkweed if you're looking for one that's not going to uh, um, be quite as uh, um, I don't, know, I, want to, I don't want to say invasive, but quite as uh, aggressive as, uh, as your common milkweed might be. This one's not going to spread as fast, um, but uh, the butterflies like it just as much. Actually, I feel the younger ones um, have a lot more smaller leaves, and I've noticed um, caterpillars on those even more than the common milkweed, it seems like. So um, that's a good one. That has really the, the color is what's, what sells you on this one. Um, so it'll be a uh, uh, middle of the summer, um, bright pop of yellow, for, or yellow and orange, because some of the even native ones um, uh, have a more yellow um, cast to them. And, and I know they sell more of the yellow varieties now as well. So I don't have a great picture of this one. I haven't tried it as much um, in the garden. It's a good prairie um, plant, though. Um, I planted a bunch of these plugs that you see here 
last year at home. I'm testing them out. It's a uh, it's a good one for uh, Johnson County area. If, if you're a Hawkeye fan, it's got black and gold flowers. <laughs> Something to uh, um, to add some black and gold. That's <clears throat> excuse me, not just uh, um, your traditional black-eyed Susan. So to add some black and gold diversity there. So as you can see on that tag there. It gets a little taller as well. <clears throat> so probably my favorite of the non-natives in here, but a, a plant that um, if you're going to use a non-native that uh, fits kind of that, that prairie aesthetic, the textures, the, um, the colors, the movement, uh, the good pollinator habitat um, is calament. Um, so it's, uh, it's always full of bees. Um, has a, a very uh, um, strong smell, really. Um, some people like it. Uh, some people don't like it as much. I, I kind of enjoy it. Um, the bees, uh, you see a few on there, obviously enjoy it. Um, but if this was a video of it, you would hear all the buzzing around. So tons of small um, pollinators, bees, uh, um, native bees and wasps. Um, I really love, love this plant. And it'll stay blooming until, you know, it's frosted a few times. It even gets more of a purple um, color on the uh, um, the petals as it has more time into the fall and frost, but it'll start blooming sometime in in July usually, and kind of go on from there. And in the spring, it's really nice too because it's this bright green color and almost has a, a ball shape um, when it's it's growing. Um, so it's it's kind of got more of a formal look at that time of year, and also short enough that that makes a good edge planting. So. Um, a lot of times, uh, our, our natives, we don't have as many short ones um, because in the prairie, they, you know, unless they were a really early bloomer. Um, so this one kind of fills that niche that I haven't found um, as many natives to, to fill. Here's another winter image. Uh, this is just a seed head of uh, Joe Pieweed. So you can see that that seasonality is something I, I really look for when selecting plants. Um, this has a little bit of frost on it, and it, it really even adds adds more to it, I think. Um, and you can get shorter varieties. This is just the, the straight native here, so this was taller than me um, in this, uh, this plant. But you can get a one called Little Joe, and there's other varieties as well that'll stay, oh, knee to waist height. And if you have a big garden, um, another uh, uh, big one you might want to try um, I haven't used these as much in town, but this is from my, my home garden. Um, it's compass plant. Um, you need a lot of other plants around it to keep enough structure so it doesn't tend to fall over unless you want to do staking. Um, but uh, this would be a good native uh, prairie plant. Um, you can see it's called compass plant. You can even see on the leaves there, they face uh, um, north and south. They point north and south, um, so it's always getting sun throughout the day. Um, it's a really cool plant. And then if you're looking for some shadier um, spots, maybe you have a lot of shade in your garden, um, these next plants will be, be some for that. So wild geranium, um, this picture is over at Rochester Prairie. Um, so these are some, some natives uh, in the uh, savanna there um, that are really a lot of good color in the spring. Uh, make another good one to sell at your plant sale because it's usually blooming right around then, um, so it's a, it's a nice plant as well. Probably my favorite uh, wood, um, woodland um, uh, perennial would be white wood aster, because um, you get that, that fall color in your, um, your woodland planting. And uh, um, you know, you've, you've got a lot of greens that work well in the uh, shade, but not as many things that bloom. Um, this, you can see, has a little bit of yellow and uh, then the pinkish red um, mixing with that, that white of the petals, um, so it makes a nice contrast. It, uh, um, the vegetation is a little bit lower throughout the season, and then these seed heads shoot up and make these, uh, these nice uh, colors. Um, and I've got a few of those in the bundle there, too, that uh, um, really keep almost some of those petals uh, throughout the winter or that kind of that, that structure beneath the petals that looks nice. 
one that goes with that, this is, I apologize, not the greatest photo, but for some reason, when this one blooms earlier in the spring, I'm not taking as many photos usually. Um, it's one of the only things that really is, is uh, tends to be blooming in these few weeks that it's uh, at peak, but uh, um, Bowman's root, um, you can't see as well here, but where it's really bright in the photo, there's a little, um, a really uh, dainty uh, flowers um, that are, are kind of at the top of it, and this will do well in the shade too, um, and kind of, uh, um, I pair it with the white wood aster um, fairly often. Um, there's some of this at City Hall downtown, um, along with wood aster, and where we couldn't get things to grow as well, these have reseeded and, and filled in, so it's, it's done really well for us. But then during the spring, before all of these uh, pop up, um, we have Glory of the Snow. Um, so this is a good thing just kind of to bridge that gap to get you all excited about what's to come in the, uh, the year. So these will be popping up pretty quick, actually. Um, and I could do a whole talk on the maintenance of these spaces, um, but I'll just briefly touch on it here. We don't mulch our spaces um, typically. Um, but we mow them each year, either with a mower set really high or with a uh, um, weed eater um, and go around each plant, being careful not to get into the crown of the plant. And then we let that material lie around them and it becomes a natural mulch. Um, so uh, it's, it's a lot better for the plants than, uh, if you think about it, most plants didn't grow in, in you know, chunks of wood, tiny chunks of wood that tend to drown them out, but they did grow in their own, you know, plant matter, leaf matter, things like that, um, which is really evident in a prairie as it starts to, uh, um, you know, lose its height at this time of year and, and break down. Um, so a lot of these plants do really well, and, and this plant will especially does really well to, um, right after you cut things down for a couple weeks, it doesn't look as, as great because it's, it's kind of sad to see all the texture you have in the winter go for a couple of weeks and, and then you see this color come in and that's always, always a good, good thing. I like daffodils as well. Um, deer don't eat them. <laughs> that's kind of their biggest thing. Uh, little critters don't dig them up. Um, so I don't use as many tulips. They, they don't tend to last as long. Um, I don't have anything against tulips, but I don't like to having to plant them every year and, and everything. But daffodils will, um, will kind of naturalize and, and uh, continue to grow. So another good, good one, not, uh, not a native, but, uh, but we'll uh, add some color in that, that first part of the year. So now I'm going to get into a few combinations of, of plants that uh, um, really worked well together in textures and colors and things like that throughout the season. Um, so in the back there is a yellow bulb allium. And in the front, Arkansas Blue Star. This one is Blue Ice, one of the shorter varieties. Um, so Arkansas Blue Star, not native to Iowa, but it is native to the Midwest. Um, so uh, I would say it's, it's kind of uh, almost part of the native club, um, but a, a great plant. Uh, this variety and others you'll see in, in follow-up photos. You can do the same thing with a couple other plants if you like that blue and yellow um, color scheme. Um, so this is catmint and uh, uh, one of the uh, yellow yarrows. Um, so uh, yarrow native, catmint not, but they're working really well together here to create some texture and, uh, and color. And then you see in the back there, there's some of that Joe Pye weed. Just, uh, it's already pretty tall at that time of the year, um, but uh, adding some more of that coarse texture behind there is kind of nice as well. So a couple of you mentioned coneflowers or echinacea. Um, so this is one that's uh, um, kind of a selection or was found um, growing uh, in Tennessee um, uh, native and it has a little bit different form. I've tried this one out at home and liked what I've seen. So I may use a little bit more of this one. Um, not quite like the, uh, all of the purple coneflowers you'll see in the um, nursery centers. Um, those have been bred, rebred so many times, either the purples, the pinks, the white ones. Um, I just don't see them lasting as long in the gardens. So something like this that was a selection of a native um, or a, a native that uh, um, was propagated 
um, from those native seeds um, tends to do a little bit better. It's a little hardier. Um, and uh, you can also use uh, pale purple cumflower, um, which we'll see in some photos coming up here, um, which would have been the one that was native to Iowa. And then you've got yarrow. So this is an example of using um, the other kind of yarrow or the other color of yarrow. Um, so pink with pink can be kind of nice. So playing with your colors, your textures, remembering your bloom times, it's, it's all quite complex when you uh, really drill down into it. But uh, um, trying to think of all those things, think of what grows fast and, uh, and what might not, and how the garden changes throughout the year in, in height and color and texture, all of those things. So here's getting to a little bit more complex uh, um, planting. So you've got a few things here. So mixing textures, once again, this is in the fall. You see the, uh, um, the calumet in the back has some of that, that purple color I was talking about before. But then you've got nice, uh, um, the native uh, prairie drop seed, another great native grass there in the middle with Arkansas Blue Star, one of the other varieties um, up front there. So you got some nice yellow fall color and, and more texture as well. Then this isn't one of my plantings, but this is at a um, garden in Wisconsin. So you can see if you have a shady spot, you can go pretty, pretty simple, but still have color and texture. So there's some U in the background for that, that backdrop. Um, a couple of different kinds of hosta. Um, I don't use a ton of hosta, but, uh, but they are nice to fill in. Um, they've got a more coarse texture, but then when you got some of those, those white edges on the one in the background is nice. And in this instance, the, the wild ginger is being used kind of like uh, the sedge would also be to fill in the space around things to keep down on weeds, and it, it does really well in the shade. So here you see that nodding onion. This is a native. Um, it's really cool the way it, uh, it kind of bows over like that. And uh, it'll stand up a little bit more as it uh, starts to uh, bloom, but uh, the bloom will look like a circle, but if you get up real close to it, um, that globe's kind of coming off of the, the curve of it as well. Then you, once again, you see some of that butterfly weed in the background and, and catmint in the foreground. Um, so once the allium starts to bloom, you'll have the pink. So you got pink, orange, and purple all in this one little area. Kind of continuing on with the, the alliums, everyone kind of thinks of alliums as the, the bulb ones. So you've got those, you know, those gladiator ones that are almost as big as your head, um, or this size is uh, purple sensation. Um, so you've got uh, um, all the different sizes of that. I like it, it adds some whimsy to the garden. Um, and uh, Catman in the background, and then a, a great uh, native in the foreground there, um, uh, false indigo. Um, you can get wild white indigo, which is more native. Um, it, it doesn't have as much um, vegetation at the base, but it still sends up nice white uh, um, panicles of, uh, of color. Like this one is one of the um, recent cultivars that's got a purple end uh, at the base with that, that nice yellow coming off of it. So once again, using those, those colors that complement each other, those yellows and purples in this instance. Um, butterfly weed in the foreground again. Um, and then another one I haven't talked about, betony. Um, that's a, a great one that uh, um, I don't cut it back after it blooms. Um, I like to leave the little um, seed heads up top where those, those purple are there. Um, and it, it'll stay like a coarse texture throughout the whole winter. And then it's not blooming yet in this uh, photo, but I, a lot of times I'll kind of let Prairie Blazing Star um, kind of seed and run wherever it wants as well. Um, it creates some uh, upright uh, vertical structure and those will have that, that next wave of purple that will just overlap with the betony a little bit. So here you can see um, oak leaf hydrangea kind of uh, early on. Um, so one of those shrubs to add some of that uh, base to things and that coarse texture. Um, I don't mind iris, just traditional iris in the background. If you have some of those, you can always split them up, move them around. Um, they've got nice color when they're blooming as well. Um, once again, there's blazing star here, cat mint and butterfly weed. And then one little rouse stink master popping up in the background there. Here's a little bit more complex uh, um, 
uh, planting, um, a little less uh, size to each of the groupings. So when you really drill into a, a close-up like this, um, you see a lot of different colors and textures. So here's that prairie blazing star blooming. Um, there's some autumn joy sedum right behind that. That uh, um, you know, that's that's something that everyone probably knows here. It's not a native, but it adds some good structure. So um, it's not going to hurt uh, to add that in um, with the with the natives. You see that fine texture of this uh, um, this Arkansas blue star that's here. Um, some of the others have a coarser texture. You've got some of that that purple or pink just starting to bloom with the uh, summer budialium, and then uh, rattlesnake master again, and then um, the uh, fireworks goldenrod. I don't necessarily recommend most goldenrod because they can take over, but this one called fireworks, I, I've had uh, good luck with. Um, and it puts on quite the show in the fall, as you'll see in a couple of slides. I prefer Siberian iris um, uh, if I'm planting iris. So here you see, uh, you know, it's not native, obviously, but um, it really works well. It almost looks like a grass once it's done blooming, and I like that, that texture. So there's some Carl Forster grass in the middle there that uh, has a similar um, kind of leaf shape and, and form at this time of year um, when this was taken. Um, and uh, you can just kind of see some of those other layers going back into the garden. So thinking about it from if there's a spot like this is at, at my house near, uh, um, near my driveway and kind of front yard, so these are the levels um, going back. This is what I come home to. I like to see all the, the different colors, and it kind of invites you in as, as you uh, um, kind of move into the garden. So here's that fireworks goldenrod I promised uh, you on the left there. Um, really great in the fall. Um, the bees love that as well. Um, one of those grasses I don't get a lot of good pictures of is Indian grass. It just kind of adds some height in the background here. And there's some big blue stem on the other end in the background. Um, that one I believe is uh, either Red October or Blackhawks uh, variety. And then there's some black-eyed Susan. You've got those darker seed heads there. Um, and then uh, just some of those others we've talked about. You can even see after butterfly milkweed, bottom left there is done blooming. It adds some nice uh, um, green throughout the rest of the year. So those were kind of spots around um, other gardens and my garden. But now we'll go through quickly some of the, uh, um, the areas around Iowa City that you may have seen and where we've used these plantings. So this was one of the first, well, probably the first uh, planting in this style um, uh, we did once I started in Iowa City. This is the medians on Washington Street. This is just up from City Hall. Um, this was before we had um, the same number of staff we've, we've been able to uh, build to now. Um, we used uh, volunteers from City Hall. Some of them don't have windows in their offices, so they were more than happy to get out for an afternoon and help us plant uh, plugs. I believe Linda was there to help us plant that day, too. Um, so really, uh, uh, we planted a, a large stretch there in, in a really short amount of time. They actually caught up to me as I was laying them out because um, they were so uh, efficient with their work. And uh, this has some of those plants we, we've talked about already, um, pale purple coneflower, um, the sedge there. Um, we've even got bulbs in the spring. There's a lot of daffodils that pop up. Um, there's coreopsis, which I haven't talked as much about. I've got a bit of a love-hate relationship with it. It either grows well for me or not at all. Um, it's not one that's going to last as long in your garden, probably, but if, if you're willing to add it um, every three or four years back in again, it can be a good one. Um, but this really just invites you up that, that hill um, up from City Hall. Another early planting we did, we were planting a bunch of annuals in City Park near the big parking lot. And uh, I wanted to try something different uh, um, rather than having, you know, annuals are only good for a certain amount of the year. Um, they don't have, uh, um, they don't fill in as quickly. They cost money each year to plant new ones. Um, so we took some of these plants, the, the purple coneflowers there came from Chauncey Swan Park before it was redesigned. So we reused those plants. Same with the Carl Forrester grass there. Um, you can see uh, salvia, one that I haven't talked as much about, but a perennial salvia in the foreground there. Um, as well, you can see a little bit of the shrub pop popping up there. 
um, with, uh, with some nine bark, which I believe is, yep, on the next slide. This is just a, a different time of year in that same garden. Um, so you can see that, that nine bark I talked about earlier is a pop of color and structure, um, as well as some of the summer beauty alley I'm up front there. Um, purple prairie clover, um, that will uh, kind of spread and, and do its own things, but it's, it's a good, uh, um, nice purple color. That's also in that, that median I showed you a little bit ago on Washington Street. Um, bees love those as well. So as I promised, I'd, I'd show you kind of what, what this turned into by City Hall. Um, I'm sure some of you have been by recently, but uh, um, this was, this project was like four years ago, most of it was planted. Um, so here it is, I believe this was last summer or the summer before. Um, you got the bottle brush buckeye with some of those, those white blooming panicles there on the left. Um, that nine bark again, there's bayberry in the background there, which you'll see on the next slide as well. Um, an, another shrub I haven't talked about yet. You got some height with the Joe Pye weed there on the, the top left. But then just mixing in all those other colors and textures and everything in the foreground, um, you see some of the names of them on there, um, but really just creating those levels and uh, kind of pockets of color. So here's from the other direction. Um, this kind of shades or shields that uh, the parking lot that's there from, from the view on Washington Street as well. Um, so this is a really nice place. A lot of city employees on their breaks will go out and, and enjoy this area. I get comments quite a bit from some of them about seeing bees and everything out there. Um, our city manager's office is in the, the building right there, kind of overlooking it as well. So um, it, it gets a lot of view from a lot of different angles. Um, most employees kind of walk in this corner of the building as well. Um, so it's kind of a nice, nice space there. Um, farmers markets right across the street as well. So um, as uh, more gatherings happening at that again, I'm sure there'll be more people milling around by this. Also at City Hall, here's a planting that kind of shows you can use just a few species and uh, come up with something that, uh, um, that's pretty dynamic. Of all of the plantings we've done, I probably get the most questions or comments or, or likes about this one. This is kind of that berm space um, by the corner of uh, um, Washington and uh, um, I'm blanking on the, the street there, but <laughs> Gilbert. Gilbert, thank you, Washington and Gilbert. Um, so you'll see the, the sedge that I talked about before, filling the space in between things. Um, you got summer beauty allium, and then we've, we put some bulb alliums in there as well, which adds that same repetition of the allium shape, um, but blooms a little bit earlier as well. So once again, here's the, uh, the space at Cardigan. This was our first uh, um, park that had a, um, a fire pit in it. Um, so planting is kind of natural there because uh, you, you've got uh, a lot of people using that space and kind of gathering there for a longer amount of time. But like I say, this didn't have uh, a lot of desirable um, features in it. You do see some nine bark there and some Carl Forrester, which were kind of the beginnings of what we worked with. And this is what we turned that into. Um, my staff gets all the credit for this one. They took extra plants from our other planting projects over a two to three year period. And this is where we added them in. So they just kind of had fun naturally going, uh, um, going out there and, and placing them um, how they thought would look best, um, learning from what they were seeing in the other gardens. So um, they had, uh, you know, they had no, formal training on this planting style, um, but they were able to, to replicate this um, just by uh, kind of seeing and um, seeing what worked well for them. So um, that's what I would suggest to all of you. Every yard, yard garden is going to be a little bit different. So figuring out works, what works well for you, what fits your style, and really building off of that. Um, this one's uh, also nice in the winter. Um, so you've got that, that texture that stays um, throughout the year. Um, so this is one of my, my more, more favorite spaces we've, we've done as well um, and created. This picture here shows spacing. So 
I can get a whole lot into that part of uh, the design process, but what I would say is throw the tag away. Don't follow the spacing on the tag. Um, that spacing is great if you want to mulch space all around your plant, but um, I don't personally like to see a sea of mulch. I like to see more plants working together to fill in that space, keep down on the weeds. So in this instance, uh, you see they're, they're really close together, 15, 18 inch on center at, at most typically. If you get something really big, maybe it's, it's 20 to 24 inches, but, um, but you kind of see that there. And this is on um, Clinton Street downtown. Um, really tough location, gets salt spray all winter and everything else, but, but these plants have done really well for us. This is the second stretch of median on Washington Street. This is getting further east, kind of. There's, there's a few sororities in the neighborhood up here. Um, we were just mowing this space. It was a, a turf space that the turf was failing and um, not adding much of anything. So um, we decided to add, add plants here, and it's actually less time and maintenance than mowing it every week. Um, but there again, you see some of those combinations of plants. And this is probably my favorite of the median spaces we've done. And this takes a beating. I mean, some of the big parking lots there dump their snow on it in the winter, and it pops back every year. We'll, we'll add some in each year, but, but um, all of the, uh, the bones of it really stay, and we're just adding a few things each year. And we're getting towards the end here. This is another planting style we have tried. Um, so one of the, the first images with the, the other people of inspiration, um, Austin Eyshide was on there. Um, he was at Iowa State the same time I was, and he does uh, um, horticulture design in Chicagoland area now. And what he tried at Midwest Ground Covers um, was in their trial garden, um, taking their, um, their evergreen trial garden and adding grasses and sedges around them instead of using mulch there. Um, so this is what we've tried to emulate on Iowa Avenue here. Um, and as the evergreens start to grow with age, it'll get even better. But this is the, the crew planting these. Um, and uh, you see, once again, these are spaced slightly further apart, but, uh, but some of these grasses uh, get a little bit bigger here. And we had all different sizes from gallon pots to plugs to um, four inch pots. And you see by the fall, it didn't really matter which size it was, um, I'd say. Whatever's available to go with, that's what we did here because this is that first fall and this is how fast that's grown in already. Let me see some of the, the way the different grasses and textures work together. Um, and I kind of like this, uh, you know, we added some Black Eyed Susans in, um, kind of uh, highlighting the, uh, the city's uh, um, flower, um, that black and gold color. I don't use a lot of them together because they can have some health issues if they're all in one place, but dotting them throughout has been successful. The same garden, kind of further up, um, up the uh, the way, the old capital would be right behind the uh, the view of it, behind that tree there. And then this is the second spring, so you can see, uh, or the spring directly following planting. So you can see even that that first um, first year of establishment really got that and those roots going well, and it's really filled in. Um, so like I said, Allium is my favorite genus. Uh, I just uh, uh, like, uh, like the way they are. There's, like you say, there's the nodding onion, which is the native, but also some of the others are good non-natives that work well and add that and that texture and um, aesthetic of the prairie to it as well. So if you guys have questions, I can take those now, um, but thank you all. Yes. Oak leaf hydrangea and the other hydrangeas, do you need to be concerned about acidifying the soil like you do many hydrangeas? I don't on those, and most of them have a, a white flower anyway, um, so it's not going to affect the, the flower color. Um, they've got a white, like a white with a pink color coming through it, so they, that's what they would do naturally. So they do a little bit better in our soil conditions. Yeah, good question. Others? Yeah, can, are we coming around to the mic? Is that right, Linda? Perfect. 
Hi, Pam. How you doing? Good. The, um, you were talking about the Pennsylvania sedge. Mm -hmm. How close would you plant them together then if you were doing like a horseshoe type, um, you know, uh, yeah. area? Yep, so the Pennsylvania sedge, I, I would tend to plant 15 inches on center, um, maybe a little bit less. Um, I know it's going to cost you more up front for the plant material, but you're going to enjoy it a lot quicker and not have to do as much weeding. So um, somewhere around 15 inches. Um, you could go even less if you wanted to, but I wouldn't go much more than that. Good question. Thank you. Yeah. Now, I I'm wondering about the, uh, the park with the f fire pit. Where is that? Yeah, good question. So Cardigan Park is on the far east side of town. It's uh, um, just kind of the north, northeast corner of the Windsor Ridge area. Okay. Kind of not too far off Court Street. Yeah, good question. Could you, could you spell that? Yeah, Cardigan like the sweater, okay. C-A-R-D-I-G-A-N. A lot of those um, plants I didn't recognize. There were several that I did, but where do you get these plants? <laughs> I mean, what is your source? Do you get yeah. them locally or do you get them um, um, the online stuff? Or? Yeah, so to source plants, uh, all of the above pretty much. Um, I would say landscaping tends to have a lot of these. I see on, on their lot, and they've, they've added a lot more natives lately to their selection as well. Um, I've got a few online. Um, uh, Prairie Nursery is kind of my go-to online source. Um, the ones we buy for the city plantings tend to come wholesale, um, either from uh, Midwest ground covers or intrinsic perennials. Um, those aren't available to, you know, just okay. the general homeowner, but most of the garden centers around buy from those places as well. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so anything you saw in my garden at home came from a local source. Okay. I mean, even Lowe's sometimes has, you know, some good native plants or, or hardy plants. Just get them before they've sat around too long. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Well, that's all we got. Thank you again for having me and enjoyed it. Thanks very much, Tyler. Uh, I remember Tyler's first uh, effort, and it was within a two or three days. I'll just give you a hint of how quickly he adapted. There were two school buses of young kids, junior high and high school, and he helped coordinate what they were going to do, and I had a small crew, and they were spread out all over the city, and they lasted all day. It was exhausting for me, but so thank you, Tyler. We're going to take a minute break, and then we'll introduce Mike Anderson.
Okay. So if it doesn't Time to settle down. We're ready to start class. They look a lot alike, though. My picture is sometimes mixed up with screen. Yes. If you need some more evaluation forms, we, uh, we have them right here. Chris has some. I have them right here. You can pick them up. We're going to get started again. So if you could get into your seats, please. OK. Mike Anderson is a retired Rockwell engineer who completed his master gardening training at Lynn County in 2006. He's a regular at Lynn County Winter Gardening Fair and at public libraries throughout the area. Mike's presentations are among my favorites, and when he presents, I'm usually in the audience. His topics include outstanding trees of the Midwest, ash tree alternatives, outstanding shrubs for the Midwest garden, and gardening with color. This year, he presented Create a Toad House. Mike has also led tree walkabouts at Bruce Moore, He's been a member of the Lynn County Extension Council since 2015. Today, Mike is presenting What's Wrong with My Tree? Learning to correctly diagnose a tree problem is an important first step in saving an unhealthy tree or determining when a tree becomes a hazard and has to be removed. His, syste his systemic approach to examining trees highlights the environmental, bacterial, and insect-related tree issues to discover possible problems and solutions. Please welcome Mike. Uh, th thank you, Linda. Uh, as Linda mentioned, I have been a master gardener since 2006, and up until the pandemic, I've worked the Hort Line at least once a week since that time. And some of the most common questions that we get are, what's wrong with my tree? <laughs> so in 2020, for the, our Winter Garden Fair, I put, to, put together this presentation that covers most of the questions that we receive during the, the growing year on trees. By the way, you know what the other two most common questions are? What kind of a bug is this and how do I kill it? <laughs> what kind of a weed is this and how do I kill it? So, so trees are a valuable in source, uh, resource and uh, important to our environment. And you know a, a, a mature tree in your front yard can increase your property value by as much as $10,000. So it's important to diagnose problems early so that you can avoid having to call Joe in to take your tree down like this picture here. It's also important that if you do discover that there's something wrong with your tree to get it out of the, the uh, environment before it becomes a hazard. So these are some factors causing unhealthy trees. Probably the first in there in order of importance, the environmental stress. That's probably represents 50 to 60% of the problems with trees. That's drought, uh, flood, windstorms, that type of thing. Site problems are the next most important. That's planting the wrong tree in the wrong place, uh, planting a tree too close to a structure so that in 20 years it has to be taken down, that type of thing. Third, mo third most common is animal inj injury. And then you think of diseases and, and in, uh, Insects being a, a common problem with trees, really that represents about 10 to 15 percent of, of tree issues. Mm -hmm. so, so when you're diagnosing a tree problem, it's, it's, first of all, it's important to understand what the parts of the tree are. Basically, you've got three parts, the roots, the trunk, and the canopy. So if any one of these parts are not functioning properly, you're going to see the tree decline and probably eventually die. So the roots are responsible for absorbing nutrients, water, and oxygen. That's transported up through the trunk and the branches to the canopy, which is the leaves or the needles. And then the uh, leaves or needles absorb carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, combine that with the nutrients they've gotten from the roots. And uh, through sunlight, photosynthesis is accomplished, 
which produces glucose that feeds the rest of the tree. So again, as I say, any, if any one of these parts is malfunctioning, it can cause a decline in the tree. So I'm going to take a systematic approach to diagnosing tree problems. First, we're going to look at the leaves or the canopy. Then we're going to look at the trunk and the branches. Then we're going to examine the roots. So look at the foliage first. I'm <clears throat> looking for possible insect infestations, diseases, which can be either fungal or bacterial, or stress. And uh, that's lack of one or more of the key elements required for photosynthesis, light, water, or nutrients. So first of all, do the leaves have holes or ragged edges? Or are there needles missing? Well, you've probably got a chewing insect. Remember Don Lewis's class? You got chewing insects and sucking insects. So first we're going to go over chewing insects. The common ones here are grasshoppers, beetles, and <coughs> sawflies, and caterpillars. So about the second week in May, we start getting calls. What's this ugly black worm that's on my mugal pine? Uh, it's a sawfly. It's a, a, a wasp. So they lay their eggs on the mugal pine in the fall. They overwinter. And then in the spring, the uh, larva of the sawfly starts emerging. They start eating all the needles on the mugal pine. Now, it's a real problem with mugal pines because uh, for, for pines, you know, to keep that pin cushiony look of a mugal pine, you clip off the candles about the 1st of June. And so most of what's in, in the plant are the needles from previous years. Well, if the uh, uh, sawfly larvae eat all those needles, it's going to make a, a, a nude branch and really make an ugly looking plant. So it's important to get rid of these as soon as you start seeing them. And you can use insecticides. That's what my wife always used to like to use. She would spray them with seven about the first of May, and that'd take care of the problem. Uh, I used to just pick them off if there aren't too many, but I found a, a good, strong hose is really effective. You can uh, squirt them all off. When they fall on the ground, they're not programmed to climb back up on the branch. They'll just um, wither and die. So, Well, it turns out there's about 4,000 different species of this sawfly. For just about every woody plant that is evolved, an associated sawfly has evolved with it. So here's a couple examples. You see the maple leaf sawfly is totally different than what I showed you on the mugo pine because these have evolved with the maple leaf to be camouflaged with the, with the leaf. Same with the gooseberry example. Other chewing insects are uh, bugs, the caterpillar, grasshopper. I understand that that catalpa uh, caterpillar makes good fishing bait. I don't know. Any fishermen here? Yeah. <laughs> you know, as a kid growing up in the 50s, about August, there would be just swarms of grasshoppers everywhere. And I just don't see those anymore. I don't, I, what's happened to them? But. And then our favorite, the Japanese beetle. Have, have you got this in, in Iowa City? I know we got it in Cedar Rapids about 10, 15 years ago. And when I was giving a talk at the Winter Garden Fair, the people from Iowa City hadn't gotten it yet. Anyway, this arrived in the country about uh, 1916, it was first discovered in New Jersey, and by 2015, it had gotten over all of the United States except for about nine western states. So it has slowly progressed across the country. Now back in the 40s and the 50s, major cities like Chicago dumped tons and tons of DDT into the environment trying to kill this guy, and all they accomplished was killing good insects, and a few songbirds to the point where DDT was finally banned uh, use in, uh, in the 70s. So, so how do you get rid of it? Well, one method is planting disease or plant resistant varieties. I know there's a few crab apples that uh, the Japanese beetle don't attack. I've had good luck with the Donald Lyman crab apple, prairie fire crab apple. I know a lot of the older varieties, 
they just get denuded from the Japanese beetle about the end of the summer. You can do nothing. In most cases, the damage really isn't all that uh, severe. You can use garden fabrics. That probably doesn't work on a large tree. Maybe a small shrub would work on that. You can use traps. That's not really recommended. Uh, there's something satisfying about taking a, about a thousand dead Japanese beetles out to the trash every night, but you're probably attracting more beetles into your yard than if you didn't use the traps at all. You can use insecticides at the first sign of uh, infestation. There's grub control. The idea there is that you kill the Japanese beetle while it's still in the larva stage before it becomes a beetle. Uh, I don't think that's very effective either. You're going to kill the grubs in your yard, but how about your neighbor's yard or the neighbor down the street? You know, when a Japanese beetle wakes up in the morning, it can travel as much as a, a mile before it finds its first meal. So uh, you can use tree injections or insecticidal soil, soil drenches. I know that's a, a popular thing. I think Bayer makes a product that they uh, sell in the big box stores and, and the nurseries. So. Let me go over the, uh, some of the insecticides in order of toxic, toxicity. Probably the least toxic of all of the insecticides is neem oil. It's a natural product com that comes from the neem tree. The neem tree goes, grows natural in, in India. You can use insecticidal soaps. You know, insects breathe through their, their uh, skin. So an insecticidal soap clogs up their uh, breathing mechanisms so they suffocate. The problem with that is, that, again, it's not going to work on a large tree because you have to ha uh, contact the, uh, the beetle. There's carbon mates. Uh, seven is an example of that. That's an insecticide. Or you can use a nu what I call the nuclear option. It's anything that includes th this chemical imidacloprid. Um, Uh, it's applied to a tree or a shrub either with an injection or a soil trench. And that's absorbed into the, the tree or shrub, and every cell in that tree and shrub actually becomes a poison stick. So any animal or bug that ingests any, any part of that tree or shrub will die instantly. And that's why I call it the nuclear option. I wouldn't be surprised if eventually this isn't banned too like DDT. It's really a very, very lethal product. So we talked about biting insects. These are the, or chewing insects. These are the sucking insects. Scales, aphids, mealybugs, white flies, trips, and mites. You know you've got one of the, well, this is a picture of a scale. And the aphids are really, really small. You almost need a microscope to see them. And they'll be on the under, underside of the leaf. And what makes them a problem is they suck the, the, the juice right out of the leaves, which probably doesn't kill the tree. Um, it does make a mess. If, if uh, I know in Chicago we had four um, maple trees in the... Uh, in the front yard, and they were all infected by scale. And that when they, they suck the juice out of the, the leaves, it's actually uh, bug poop, which forms this, what they call honeydew, which is a, a sticky substance that gets on the ground and all over, over everything. If you park your car under one of these trees that's got scale on it, the next morning you'll find a real thin film of this uh, uh, sticky substance on it. So it's more of a mess than a, it is really a deterrent to the tree. So anyway, control. You can wipe the leaves off with the mild solution of just soap. Again, that probably only works on a small tree or a, or a bush. You can hose it off every couple days with a hose. Again, it probably doesn't work on a large tree. It, the trees I had in Chicago were uh, probably 50 feet tall all, and none, none of these would have worked on that. Neem oil, again, that. that only works on smaller things. Insecticidal soap or uh, something like seven or eight. Or you can use a nuclear option. Are there bumps on the leaves? We always, about the middle of the summer, we always get somebody bringing these leaves in with these ugly bumps on the leaves. 
And what they are is uh, spider mites that have laid their eggs in the leaf. And to counteract that, the uh, tree forms this uh, chamber around the, the, uh, the, the eggs and makes, makes these bumps. Uh, really doesn't hurt the tree. It uh, looks worse than it is. And quite often within about a month, these are, disappear completely. Are there spots of partial discoloration or blisters present? The two pictures on the left are anthracnose. It, it's a, a fungus, and it's very common here in Iowa, especially if we have a wet, uh, cool spring. Um, the one in the upper middle, that's rhizos rhizospheral <coughs> needle cast, very common with blue spruce. Um, and then apple rust, that's a, a symbiotic uh, fungal disease that travels between um, help me out here Jun junipers and the fruit trees <clears throat> and then the two on the far left are wilt disease and those are typically uh, transported by uh, a beetle of some kind that um, it carries the disease and uh, open wounds on trees or sap on the trees attract it. And when it goes to uh, munch on the sap, it carries the disease with it. That's, uh, the oaks are a very common uh, one that has this disease. And that's why we recommend don't prune oak trees, except in, uh, when they're completely dormant to prevent having this disease. Both of these are diseases are fatal to the tree. So if they get it, you're, you're going to lose the tree. And that brings up uh, about pruning. Again, just there are so many diseases that, that are transported from the, to the sap of the tree for, on an open wound that the best time to prune is during the dormant season. And that's the only good time to prune. So a little bit about uh, some of the fungal diseases. Anthracnose is a, is a common one, uh, as I said. The spores are present everywhere, and they get infected in the leaves, and then they, they grow colonies on the leaves. And those leaves fall off in the fall, and they, they're embedded in all the leaves on the ground. And then the next spring, uh, the wind kicks those leaves up, throws those speed, spores back up in the atmosphere, where you get animals like squirrels running through the, the leaves and then climbing up in the trees. So those spores are everywhere. Uh, the reason that uh, they seem to be more common in wet, uh, cool springs is that those spores, if they hit a wet leaf, they're going to attach themselves and they're going to be able to grow then. A dry leaf, it's not so much. So when you have a wet spring, it's when we see this disease more prevalent. So the, the cures for it are basically to, to try and clean up the uh, debris every fall so to get rid of as many of those spores as possible. Uh, another thing is just plant resistant varieties. There are several varieties that are resistant to some of these diseases. Like I know there are several crab apples that are uh, resistant to the uh, uh, rust disease, fire blight disease. Um, or you can apply a fungicide. Now, for deciduous trees, it probably doesn't make much difference because those leaves, the infected leaves, are going to fall off. And they're going to go away. <clears throat> it's more important for conifers because those needles stay on there year after year after year. So once infected, they're going to stay on the tree forever. Well, not forever, but for several years. So that gets into the rhizospheral needle cast disease. That's common on our blue spruces. I don't know why we think that we should grow blue spruces in Iowa. They're native to Colorado, not Iowa. The, the summers here are just too hot and humid for blue spruce to survive. But the rhizospheral needle cast fungus is in the ground everywhere. And so when you plant a blue spruce, first time it rains, it's going to splash those spores up onto the tree and once attached and if they start growing it's going to start affecting the bottom needles or branches and then eventually work its way up the tree. So there is a cure for it. You can use this fungicide. It's a Bordeaux mixture and you put it on sometime during the last two weeks in May 
and then reapply it in uh, four to six weeks. Are the leaves deformed or cupped? This is a good example of uh, uh, being hit with a, a chemical of some kind. And if there's not much you can do with this. Maybe if, if it has just happened, you can go out with the hose and try and wash the leaves off as much as possible. And it's uh, hard to tell whether this, the tree is going to survive or not. It depends on how much of the chemical it's absorbed. But there's not much you can do other than that. This is a common question we get every year. There's bundles of leaves in my yard, and it doesn't look like the leaves or anything's wrong with them. What's causing this? Squirrels. What? Squirrels. That guy? Yep, <laughs> that's him. So the next thing to look at is the tree under stress. And here's some common examples of the tree under stress. The first one is that early August fall color. So, you know, if a tree starts turning color about the 1st of August, you know there's something stressing it out. Uh, is the tree got yellow leaves? This is common with uh, pin oaks. Uh, water sprouts. Water sprouts are a clear example that there's something wrong with the tree. You know, in, the, in the, the trunk of the tree and on the branches, there are dormant buds. And... Uh, they only become active if the main buds, you know, um, trees grow by what they call apical dominance, which means that the growth hormones are in the tips of the branch, the, the buds on the tips of the branches. So if you cut those off, it's going to push that horm those, the dominant hormones down into the lower buds on the tree. That's why if you want to make a, a plant bushy, you cut the, the terminal uh, buds off the, off the plant, which causes it to be bushy. So when you see these water sprouts, that means that something's happened in the canopy. Either nutrients aren't getting up to the leaves, or uh, anyway, something has happened to the, that, the leaves in the canopy. So to compensate, these dormant buds along the trunk of the tree all of a, all of a sudden become active. And it's trying to grow new growth to produce food for itself. Uh, I, I noticed in Cedar Rapids where we've lost from the duration, we've lost uh, many of the bigger trees have lost major branches. And so last summer, you started seeing these water sprouts coming out. The trees were compensated for, for compensating for the loss of that canopy. So of course, the next, next one is the needles turning brown on an on a, uh, evergreen tree or just die back in the crown. So any of these could be caused by something going wrong in the trunk, where the, the nutrients that the roots are collecting are not getting transported up to the canopy. So things to look for are insect infestation. Again, you're chewing and you're sucking insects. Uh, disease, fungal, bacterial, or trunk or branch injuries. So look, look at, see if you get any holes in the tree. That's a clear sign that you've got a borer problem. Here's some examples of some borer. Of course, the emerald ash borer, um, the bronze birch borer. For just about every species of tree, an associated borer, species of borer, has evolved along with that tree. And they do have a purpose in nature. When a tree becomes stressed, the borers go in and attack it and do the final coup de grace that takes that tree out of the environment, making room for new trees to grow up. The only thing is the emerald ash borer, he doesn't play fair. He attacks healthy trees, too. So here's some common symptoms of uh, the borer attack. you got the die back in the crown, um, or you get these water sprouts growing up on the side. Again, it's from the die back in the crown. So here's some uh, control methods. Try and maintain the healthy vigor of the tree. As long as the tree is healthy and not stressed, borers typically don't attack it. Uh, you can plant disease resistant or uh, borer resistant plants, trees. When you're planting non native Iowa trees, you know, trees native to Iowa have evolved over millions of years to withstand the really 
strong conditions that we have here. And trees that aren't native to Iowa just haven't evolved to compensate for the high humidity, drought, flood, all the other things that we have here in Iowa. So if you're trying, if you do want to plant a non-native tree, try and simulate the conditions as much as possible. I know white uh, birches are a very popular tree to, to plant here, but they don't grow here. They're not native to Iowa. They're native to Canada, Alaska, and the northern, northern part of New England. So if you think about what the growing conditions are in those areas, Canada, Alaska, it's cold in, in the summer, and it rains most of the time in the summer. So if you're gonna plant a white birch, at least don't plant it on the western side of your house where it's gonna get the direct sun in the afternoon. And try and mulch as much as you can around the, the root system to keep that root system nice and cool and moist during the, the hot summer months. Uh, prune only during the dormant period. I can't stress that too much. An open wound on a tree just invites bugs to come in. Um, you can use a nuclear option, again, these soil drenches, injections, and that's what we're using on the uh, ash trees. I've got 10 ash trees on my property, and it costs me about $150 a, a year to use a soil drench, as opposed to, I don't know how many thousands it would cost to uh, take those trees down. I will point out, though, if you're gonna use the nuclear option, um, make sure it's well away from anybody's garden. Um, there are no uh, flowering plants within about 15 feet of the tree. Uh, once attacked by borers, there really aren't any remedies. It might be effective on trees that are less than 30% affected. Okay, these are the sucking insects that attack the, the bark and, and the trunk. The most common one is uh, scale. And it's pretty common on magnolia trees. We usually get a call at least several times during the, the growing season with somebody saying, what's this crusty stuff on the, on the branches of my magnolia tree? I lost a magnolia tree to scale. I, I, I knew I had the problem. I didn't do anything about it. The scale had sucked enough of the juice out of the tree to, to stress it. And then that winter, we got a minus 30, 30 degree winter, and that was just enough to put it over the end and kill the magnolia tree. Anyway, the scale, uh, they don't lay eggs. The, the, the crawlers, that's the, the babies, are born live, and they're born um, in August, and they attach themselves to the branch and they overwinter there, and then in the next spring, they uh, attach themselves to the bark and start forming these colonies of these hard, crusted uh, scale on the branches. So control, uh, since the crawlers emerge in August, that's the best time to try and kill them. The scale, it's very difficult to kill the scale with any kind of insecticide because that, they have that tough, hard shell that it, and encases them. So the best time to, to kill them is when they're crawlers, and you can use any kind of an insecticide when they first appear in August. Uh, the next best uh, time to do it then would be in the spring. You can use a dormant spray. And that, that's something you put on before the leaves start emerging. And it covers the scale and uh, uh, actually smothers it. So, and then the, the final option is doing the, the nuclear option. You can try and wash, if you have a small tree, you might try and uh, take a scrub brush and some soap and water and try and brush them off as much as you can. Are there areas of dead bark or sunken discolored bark? Uh, that's typically a sign of a canker. Uh, there's a couple of trees that are very susceptible to cankers. I know locust trees are susceptible. Some of the, the fruit trees are. Again, it's from uh, this fungus attacking the tree through an open wound. Again, I can't stress too much. Don't prune except in the dormant time. Uh, 
once you get a canker, there's not much you can do except try and uh, cut that branch off that's infected. It's a typical problem with some of the pine trees. Talk a little bit about pruning. Um, well, you are master gardeners. You've probably all had the pruning class, so I won't go into too much detail, except best time to prune during the dormant season, worst time to prune all other times, and that's the reason why. In the spring, the tree is just budding out. It's taking all of its energy to, to form uh, new leaves, new growth, and uh, new seeds to, to propagate itself. During the summer, if you get any kind of dry periods, that tree is really going to be under stress. It doesn't need additional stress by doing pruning. In the fall, the tree is trying to button up for winter, and uh, again, it doesn't need any more stress at that time either. Has the trunk been injured? There's some typical problems with trunks. You got mower problems, construction, or just carelessness. Somebody has uh, girded that tree up at when it was planted and forgot to take the guide wires off. Are there splits or cracks in the bark? These are some common problems now. It didn't used to be, but uh, sun skull and frost crack. Sun skull, you know, I've been growing trees for 50 years. And I haven't had a problem with sun scald until the last few years. I've lost three trees to sun scald in the last two years. And what causes that is early in the spring, when that's right like right now, that sun is really, really hot. And early in the morning, when it shines on, on a tree uh, trunk, it's really hot, but that tree is probably still frozen from last night. So anyway, it heats that tree up, and it heats the tree up during the day. And then at night you get cold temperatures again and it freezes. So that constant thawing and freezing of the bark causes it to expand. And then eventually it just falls off like in this picture here. And I, I think it's kind of the new weather patterns that we're experiencing. Again, I say the, the, that hot March sun, but we're getting cold days like 5 degrees, 10 degrees, well into April that I don't think we used to get at all. And then the frost crack, that's typical of some of the larger trees. And the sun scald, you'll usually see that on the east side of the tree because that's that east sun early in the morning hitting the tree. Uh, frost crack, it's usually on bigger trees and it's on the northwest side of the tree. And it's caused by the same, same problem. It's that evening sun beating down on that tree and, and uh, expansion of the uh, bark in the... Uh, uh, trap, sap. Uh, and then the far left picture there is the lightning damage. There's not much you can do if a tree's been hit by lightning. So although cute, these are probably some of the most destructive things to trunks and branches on trees. <laughs> Deer, of course, during the rutting season, I, they do eat some trees. That, it's true, arborvitae is one of their favorite. But the biggest problem I've had with deer is during the rutting season, them uh, rubbing their, their uh, horns on the, uh, the tree and, and taking the, the bark right off of it. And then, of course, rabbits, they can nip a sapling right off. In the winter, if you have a really, really hard winter with a lot of snow cover, they have nothing to eat, they'll start girding the, the uh, smaller trees, the, the bark right off of them. So I found the most effective means is fencing them out. Uh, after two falls of losing most of the trees that I planted to the deer, we put, finally put a five-foot fence in. Now, the neighbors in back of us, you can kind of see at the bottom, had a three-foot fence, and of course the deer jumped right over it. No problem at all. So we put a five-foot chain-link, black chain-link fence in. Uh, that was the tallest fence that we could put in according to the code in Cedar Rapids at the time. I know a deer can typically jump a, uh, a five-foot fence with no problem at all. But you know, deer have kind of poor eyesight. And this is a black chain link fence. And you can see the top of that, that fence is quite a bit ab above the uh, line of sight of that deer. I don't think they can judge how tall that, that fence is. And that's why they've never, we've had the fence in for over 20 years and we've never had a deer jump into the backyard. And then the picture on the right is how to deal with rabbits. So I found some uh, chicken wire that has a black 
final coating on it so it doesn't rust. And uh, it's three feet wide, so I've stretched an, a foot and a half up the fence and a foot and a half along the ground just under the, the, the ground. And no problems with rabbits. Now they can easily go through that mesh in the chain link fence, but they can't get through the uh, uh, chicken wire. And then in the front yard, don't have a uh, possibility of a fence. So now the, the tree on the left is a uh, Japanese lilac tree. First year I planted it, of course, I put the uh, tubing on the trunk of the tree. And then the following spring, I found where the deer had rubbed all the other branches. And so following years, I've put this on, on the other branches to keep them away. And then the picture on the right is of a tree I just planted this summer. It's a small Korean maple. And I know the deer would just decimate that if they had a chance to. So I took this old obelisk and I put that up. And I'll probably leave that there until the tree gets a good six, seven inches. Uh, deer particularly love to rub on smooth bark trees like maple trees. I think red maple is it has a real smooth bark and that's one of their favorites. Are there mushrooms protruding from the trunk? This is usually a sign of a conch, which is a really serious problem. It could even indicate that you've got a hollow tree. If you see something like this, it's probably a good thing to, to have an arborist come out and look at the tree and see what the problem is. You know, think, you think bringing an arborist out, that, that's really expensive. Really, they only charge about $100 to come out and diagnose a tree. So that's not too bad, especially if you get a, a tree that can cause damage like this one. Next thing is to examine the roots. And you're looking for soil conditions, injuries, or restrictions. Was the tree planted too deeply? The picture on the left is what a tree should look like with that nice flare. The picture on the right is one that's either been planted too deeply or it's got girding roots. It looks like a telephone pole sticking up out of the ground. So. That's what happens when you get girdling roots. And that usually is caused by either uh, when, when it was planted, not look, inspecting the roots uh, well enough just to make sure that they weren't encircling the root ball, that they were growing out away from the trunk, or it was planted too deeply. So usually when I don't have master gardeners, I go into planting a tree a little bit. But I won't belabor this since you probably own a hot plant a tree other than to say that the two and more Im most important things are to make sure the t hole is wide enough. Remember that tree spent its last winter out in a field somewhere where it had been grown, and when it was dug up, 90% of the roots were left in the field. Only 10% of those roots came with it in the root ball. So that first year that that tree is growing, it's going to be trying to reestablish its roots. In fact, the, the, the rule of thumb is for every inch in diameter the tree is, it takes a year to reestablish the roots. So if you've got a one inch diameter, like that's most trees that you buy in the nursery, it's gonna take the first year to reestablish that roots before it's gonna start growing. A three inch tree will take three years to reestablish its roots before it starts growing. And I've got proof of that. I planted two autumn blaze maples in the backyard. One was a three inch, one was a one inch. Today, you can't tell which was the larger tree when I planted it. In fact, three, four years after I planted them, they were about the same size. So, uh, again, you want to make sure that that hole is wide enough. I, rule of thumb is I usually like to make the, the hole as wide as what the drip line of the tree is that I'm planting. And that's kind of shown in the picture here. Mm -hmm. And you want that soil nice and loose so that the roots don't have any restrictions in trying to grow. And it's, uh, if it's loose, it's going to be very porous, and there's going to be lots of oxygen in that soil. And that's what the tree needs to reestablish its roots. Uh, I know uh, as far as fertilizer go, I, I don't think it's necessary to fertilize a tree. I know Earl May would not garn tree trees that they sold unless you bought their plant starter. What that was was a high... Uh, the, the, the middle phosphorus uh, uh, fertilizer, so the middle number, make sure that's nice and high because that's what's required for growing new roots. 
are there signs of physical injury to the roots? You'll see this a lot in older neighborhoods. The other thing you'll see is where they've taken that out, cut that major root off the tree, and, and put in a new sidewalk. Signs of trenching. There are some species that will tolerate some trenching, like silver maples, cottonwoods, you know, some of the more faster growing weed trees. Um, and then there's some that are very sensitive, like oaks. Is there evidence of soil compaction? Soil compaction, again, makes, may, it, it tamps out the, the air pockets in the soil, so there's less oxygen in the soil for the tree to absorb. Are the roots restricted? Um, I don't know why it is, but we seem to want to make a circle around our trees. <laughs> Change in soil grade. Um, you know, there, uh, oxygen is re required to do photosynthesis, and it, most of the oxygen is in the upper 8 to 12 inches of the soil. So if you put a planter around a tree, like in the, the left picture, or right picture there, that's going to uh, deplete the amount of oxygen that that tree has. Eventually, that tree is going to die. And the reason most people do that is to solve this problem where you've got a shallow rooted tree, maples are notorious for this. And uh, they're, they're trying to cover up, the, it's impossible to mow around that, and it's pretty unsightly. So it's a way of uh, kind of hiding that. This is a better way, a way to do that. Just put a good mulch around it. It's a lot less expensive, and uh, to my way of thinking, a lot more, more pleasing to the, uh, the eye. And it's a lot healthier for the tree. Have chemicals been applied recently? Um, chemical sprays on your yard probably don't affect most trees, but if you've got a tree that's already under stress, this might be just enough to push it over the edge. So try and avoid any kind of chemical sprays around a stressed tree. Poor drainage. Do uh, water pool around the, the tree. We had a guy call into the Hort line. He had planted three red maple trees in his backyard, and two of them were doing great, and one of them wasn't doing so well. And so we went out to check it out, and it turned out the one that wasn't doing so well was in kind of a low part of his yard right by the drain spout coming from his garage. And we asked him if water ever pooled in that area, and he says, oh, yeah, every time it rains. Mm -hmm. Well, red maples do not like wet feet, and they do not do well in really wet soils. So. That explained why this red maple wasn't doing so good. There have been periods of drought. You know, a drought can cause a tree to decline as much as five years after the drought. It, it stresses the tree that much. This is soil too alkaline. Some trees, like pin oaks, require a slightly acidic soil in order to absorb certain nutrients. The uh, pin oak uh, has a problem absorbing iron if the soil is too alkaline. And, uh, of course, here in the Midwest, we're right on top of a cor what used to be millions of years ago a coral reef. So there's a bedrock of limestone under our, our soil, which makes it very alkaline here. This is a common question that we get. Uh, why are the uh, conifers turning brown? In the, it's usually in the spring. Now, remember, uh, leaves or needles need water in order to do photosynthesis. And since those needles persist on the tree all winter long, they're still performing some kind of photosynthesis. And so if they're not getting enough water in order to do photosynthesis, those needles start to die and they turn brown. And this is another reason why needles might be turning brown. If you get them encrusted with snow during the winter, they can't perform photosynthesis, and so that can cause them to die. Why are the needles in my white pine or arborvitae turning brown? Well, most pine trees retain their needles for about five to seven years. Turns out the pine tree only one to two years. So it's very common for a pine tree to lose about a third of its needles every year. Same with the arborvitae. And there are some years where it's a little bit more than, than, than in others, but that's a common thing. So in the summary, yeah, it's, showed you how to take a systematic approach when diagnosing, diagnosing the tree problems. You know, look at the leaves, look at the branches in the trunk, look at the root for any kind of problems. Usually it takes more than one issue uh, to, to, to
compound in order to uh, cause a, a tree to decline and die. Again, I can't stress this too much. One, of the, one thing that we can do is don't prune unless you absolutely have to during the dormant season. Uh, again, maintain healthy trees by uh, minimizing stress factors. You can plant disease resistant trees. I know there's several crab apples that are disease resistant. I would say, in fact, I think most of them on the market now are, are disease resistant. Um, they've reintroduced, several companies have reintroduced elm trees that are resistant to the Dutch elm disease. Um, and I can't stress this too much, plant native trees. They have evolved over millions of years to withstand the harsh conditions that we have here in Iowa. So. Now, everything that's in my presentation comes from ISU uh, brochures. And I, I sent Linda uh, some handouts, and in that handout, it's the, okay. That that's got my references. Now, a lot of the pictures that were in this presentation also come right out of those brochures. So, any questions? Yes. Are trees and woody shrubs still dormant now? Are trees and woody shrubs still dormant now? Yes. I, I, before the presentation, I took a gander in, the, in my backyard to see what was coming out. You know, the ground's still frozen, mm -hmm. and, but everything's still dormant. So when is it safe to... When the st leaves start popping out. Okay. As soon as you start seeing the leaves po popping out, then they're, they're growing. So. Okay. Mike, one of our master gardeners submitted an article to our newsletter about beetle juice for uh, treating Japanese beetles. It's a Bacillus thuringiensis galleria product. I'm and not they claimed it was effective and eliminated beetles on some of their bushes or plants. Is Any it a, a drenched or is it? It's a spray. It's a spray. Yeah. They okay. purchased it from uh, Gardens Alive or some huh. online okay. source. Anybody else have experience with that? Tyler, you ever hear that? Uh, I've heard of it for other plants and, and yeah. insects, so it might be effective. She claimed it was quite effective, but I, I don't have any experience with it. I tell you, there is no rhyme or reason with Japanese beetles. I, I had a flat <laughs> of impatience one year that I planted in my flower beds. And I had a few left over, so I stuck them in a pot and I set the pot on the, on the deck. The, the beetles just came in swarms and attacked the, the plants in, those, in that pot. And I tried all kinds of insecticides and everything else, and they still came in swarms. And they didn't touch the other ones in the flower beds. Huh. Didn't even touch them. I don't know. Personally, I just live with them. If they, <laughs> they eat what they will. Anything else? Well, if not, they, oh. Thank you. So, um, when you were talking about the spruce trees that um, needle drop and using the um, fungicide, you said that would cure it. It doesn't really cure it, does it? It just slows down the progress. Of, of, of which okay, so I'm talking about um, the spruce trees that get that oh, yeah, yeah. needle drop from a fungus. Fungus. We've got master gardeners that apply it to their trees, and they say it's effective. But it's something you have to do. Yeah. Every year. Yeah, and I think it's still the ones that are dead are dead, though, right? Yeah. I mean, so eventually, it's going to go. I think. Yep. We've tried it and. We gave up. <laughs> I just was curious. Again, plant native trees. The white spruce is native yeah. to Iowa, and it does, it's not as affected as much as that is. So. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thanks, Mike. How well, do I progress that to the next? Okay, yeah, next one.
Looks like we have a, a couple minutes before the next presentation, so you can get up and stretch. Maybe Esther will lead us in yoga.
get started again. Everyone take your seats. It's time to get started again. Okay, we're going to start. This is our final presentation for today. And I'm so pleased to introduce Grow Johnson County to Master Gardeners. This hunger relief and educational farm program in Iowa City started in 1998. Its, two goal, its goals were twofold, to improve access to healthy food and also um, equip aspiring growers with land-based food production experience. Grow Johnson County started in 2015 utilizing only four acres of county-owned land to grow and donate an array of fruits and vegetables to, that are highest in demand to area food pantries and provide hands-on food production opportunities for community members of all ages and all abilities. The system includes production, processing, distribution, consumption, and waste management. Much like a watershed, you don't know that it's, you aren't aware that it's there, uh, and it doesn't fit into neat political districts. The GROW team helps social, environmental, and economic features of our food systems become more equitable, more local, and more sustainable. In addition to owning and operating the Grimm family farm near Williamsburg with his wife and two sons, Jason Grimm works full-time as the executive director at the Iowa Valley Resource Conservation and Development. He's a leader in Iowa's food systems with more than a decade of experience. It's probably more now. Um, he cultivates local and statewide farm to market business supply chain networks and assists with collaborative project development. He's led numerous workshops for beginning farmers and developed tools to help producers and farmers improve efficiency and professionalism. Jason acts as a value chain coordinator. You're going to tell us what that is, right? <laughs> Connecting producers to viable markets and institutions. His expertise includes beginning farmer training, food business mentorship, food safety, and farm viability. And he is a harmonized gap produce auditor. We want to know what that is, too. <laughs> Jason's experience with food policy and infrastructure are all part of Grow Johnson County's incredible success. Also with us today is Claire Zabel, food and farm specialist. She brings an extensive background and expertise in farmers' market management, food systems, food safety, scientific writing, and organic vegetable production to grow Johnson County. She too is a harmonized gap produce auditor. Her focus is on sustainability, integration of conservation practices, using principles of soil fertility, management, cropping systems, and integrated pest management. Claire assists with the management responsibilities at the Johnson County Poor Farm, as well as working on a food safety clean start program. We'll want to know what that is, too. She has a BA in communication studies from the University of Iowa and a master's degree and certificate from Iowa State University in agronomy. Claire's final project, the evaluation of cover crop adoption decision support tools in the Midwest, summarizes cover crop specific decision support tools available to farmer and evaluated effectiveness. Please welcome Jason and Claire. Thanks, Linda. And make sure you ask us if we forgot to <laughs> say what a few of those things are, because we may not cover them. Um, well, I think our presentation is going to be a little bit different than the previous two, but both of your presentations were great. I wish I would have been here right away because I was scrambling to take notes when Tyler was talking. So, um, And thanks, Linda, for inviting us. Uh, I know you've had this plan for several years already, and it's, we're finally here. So, And spring is almost here, which is scary, in my opinion, <laughs> right now. Um, Grow Johnson County has definitely become a a big pillar of our organization. Um, Iowa Valley RCD has been around since 1998. We're based in Amana, but we have, we call the historic poor farm our second office as well, uh, especially during the growing season. Um, the organization Iowa Valley RCD, 501c3 nonprofit, we do like 90% of our work is in food systems work, and, the, and then a part of it is what we call placemaking. We manage the scenic valley 
Iowa Valley Scenic Byway between Amana and Tama for DOT as well and doing some cultural programs along that. Um, but within our food system work, we do stuff in farmers markets, food hubs, food safety for producers, training for producers, um, and more that I'm probably forgetting about. But that's definitely the biggest part of it. We're a staff of right now, six full-time staff members, uh, or yeah, six full-time staff members um, as well. And I think the introduction that Linda kind of covered everything. Claire, mm -hmm. I don't know if you have anything else you wanted to say about. Uh, try to answer some of those questions, maybe what those words mean. <laughs> yeah, so, well, the auditor question. Um, so fruit and vegetable growers, uh, if you want to sell to some buyers, like Hy-Vee, potentially if you sell to a Hy-Vee warehouse, you would have to get a third-party certification for food safety. Um, so we do auditing for farmers on that, um, produce farmers. Um, I think last year we did, uh, as a team of three of us, did about 20 here in Eastern Iowa. Um, but then uh, the Clean Start food safety program that Linda talked about is we do one-on-one -on -one coaching for farmers that have to um, implement what is called the Food Safety Modernization Act, the Produce Safety Rule, which uh, requires any fruit and vegetable farmer uh, selling over $25,000 worth of produce each year to have some level of training and uh, best practices on their farm. So we do one-on-one -on -one coaching and um, uh, site visits to farmers for that. So I'm gonna jump ahead and we'll kind of talk about where we're gonna talk about Grow Johnson County. Um, I've, so Grow Johnson County, a little bit of history, we're gonna cover about the program uh, we're going to give you more context about the Johnson County Historic Poor Farm as well. If you've never heard of that, or maybe you've only driven by and seen a sign out there in a few barns and you have no idea what's going on. Um, sadly, that is still probably the common thing, but the farm is going to become, uh, it's going to have a lot more amenities for the community and the public in the future years, coming years. Talk about our annual program evaluation. The, how do we evaluate the Grow Johnson County program and how do we do, use that evaluation for future planning of the program? Tell you about how we do everything on the farm from seeding in the greenhouse to uh, integrated pest management or we don't use, we're not certified organic, but we use organic practices um, on the farm. Talk about the tools and equipment that we use. Um, talk about our cover crop management uh, strategies and then we're going to talk about how we actually distribute about the, the approximately 30,000 pounds of food we're growing each season and all the partners throughout Johnson County and then a little bit about uh, how we're funding this work. So the Johnson County Historic Poor Farm is uh, a gem uh, here in Iowa as a state so every county used to have a, John a historic poor farm um, Johnson County's was founded in 1855. Um, as this says, it was uh, built to care for the indigenous, the develop, developmentally disabled, the mentally ill. And the concept of was that the poor farm was a place for those individuals to live, and the fresh air was um, a way to take care of those individuals. The farm is um, approximately 160 acres. It goes from Melrose to 18 down to the housing development to the south of, of there and then Slothower Road or the, or the county line, Iowa City County line is actually the, the western edge of the farm. Uh, the picture here is inside the asylum building. That's the little white building that's kind of in the middle of the, what we call the historic building complex along Melrose. This is where people lived. That, that building actually used to be closer to Chatham Oaks um, over by Melrose and was moved to the current location, but people lived in these wooden jail cells um, in 1855. That was only for a couple years before they built um, where Chatham Oaks, that's kind of the orangish brick building that's along Melrose. There was a predecessor building that was built uh, in that location, but this was the first form of housing. Uh, when this building was not used, we stored the, it was a hog house, and so it's kind of sad that people could live in a building and then it could still be used for hogs. So it's pretty sad that the building was designed that could do both purposes. But this, is, um, this building has had a lot of rehab in the last year and a half. Uh, we have clear coated all the walls and, 
and uh, ceilings and stuff because you can see there's, there's etchings, there's writing um, in the walls and we want to preserve that so that when people are rubbing their hands on it, we're not like losing that history. A lot of it is Ill, 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 I mean, you can't read it because of over time. Um, but in this coming year, we'll have some public exhibits that'll be put in this space that'll be uh, open at different times of the year um, as well. And, and there will also be some exhibits that are in the, the dairy barn and then the, the big, large uh, red barn that's on the western edge of that historic building complex will start to be open for the public to use for events. Um, Nonprofit kind of community events like this would be high on the ranking. Uh, private events like weddings would be bottom of the totem pole. The county doesn't want to compete with the private enterprises on that side. Um, like I said, the farm is really big, and most people only see it from the from Melrose when you go to the landfill or you drive out of town. But uh, the, there is a cemetery on site. Um, it is there is no marked graves. We're still doing a lot of research to know actually how many people are buried there. We've done some ground penetrating radar. Uh, the state archaeology did some uh, shallow um, uh, excavations in the last year. Um, so we think it's somewhere in the low hundreds or less out there. The, the farm is very fertile, um, but it's also there's a reasons why it was called the poor farm. The soils are, are a more of a forest uh, so, soil, so uh, there is higher clay content. Um, it doesn't drain really well in some places. Um, there's a 15-acre pollinator meadow that was planted about three years ago. Hopefully, maybe even this week or next, the following week, we'll be burning that whole 15 acres. So if you see a big plume coming from the western side of, this, of the city, that's probably what it is. It's not the landfill, hopefully, this time. Um, <laughs> We're installing a, uh, uh, a wetland uh, later this year, mm -hmm. and uh, there's a lot of timber stand improvement that's actually been happening over the winter months. So the county did a natural areas plan last summer, and then Impact 7G, a local um, natural resource management consulting company, has been out there actually uh, scrubbing uh, invasive trees, cutting down, opening up areas so that we can go in and interplant stuff um, as well. The historic poor farm um, is more than Grow Johnson County. Um, our organization and HPK Engineering actually did the master plan for the county starting back in 2016 through 2018. Um, but at the historic poor farm today, we serve as the farm manager for the county, and then we get it, the joy of working with so many other partners and tenants at the farm. So the far west, northwest corner of the farm along Melrose. You see the little hoop buildings. They're like 100 feet long. Those are all actually commercial independent tenants that have started their farms at the poor farm. Um, we call that the land access program. So land access is, is like number one on the list when it's for a beginning farm to get started. So we're helping three independent operations get started. Um, trial and error, uh, Africondo Foods, Simon and his family, uh, they don't have a business name yet. Uh, Lee Turnbull, I'm blanking the name of his. Pop-Pops. Yeah, Pop-Pops Garden. Um, and then uh, Theo, um, uh, they're just working on uh, forming a name for their business. But they all have different enterprises um, from running a CSA, selling at farmer's markets, selling direct individuals. Alfred um, is originally from Congo. He actually makes his own hot sauce product with hot peppers and um, uh, eggplant and other, other things that he's growing um, on the farm. This is actually a picture of Alfred in the pit here. Um, the hot sauce is very hot. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, take it serious when it says three, three, uh, three peppers on, on the label. Um, Global Food Project is uh, kind of up here in the, where it says B and C. Um, it's a program of IC Compassion, another nonprofit here in Iowa City. They provide uh, plots for new Iowans, immigrants, for garden plots. And they've been, I think this is going to be their fourth growing season. 2020, they took off re with the pandemic, and last year came back with really great organization and um, did really well last year. So they're expanding. I think they'll have almost 
40 to 50 plots, like families uh, gardening out there, it's hard to even uh, count up how many languages are spoken at the farm. Um, the county is, uh, we did a, a conceptual wellness trail. There will be a trail that circulates all these buildings. So we're actually just working with the design engineering team now and then starting in the county's next physical year in July is when the construction of this wellness trail, which it'll be a trail, but then there will be a lot of amenities um, along that trail as well, like a labyrinth and other things. So. Commercial kitchen, um, a lot of the tenants have said, I wish I had a place where I could take the product I'm make, growing and make it into something and sell something else. Alfred actually rents the uh, free lunch kitchen at 1105 Project uh, to make his kitchen, his product, but if he can rent the kitchen on site. So um, we're, this spring we're working with an engineering firm to do like a basic first design of this kitchen. That'll also be used by renters on site for events, like a catering kitchen. Woodland restoration I talked about, um, and then there'll be a lot of events and tours. Hopefully now that the, pa the pandemic is starting to slow down, we can open up and have a lot more things on site. This is a picture from last, yeah, last summer, probably, let's see, what do we all got planted? Yeah, it's probably late June, early July is when this was taken. Um, we're looking at the historic building complex uh, here. Uh, you can see that what we call the stock barn, which is the far west building. Um, there's a building that's being constructed right now that's going to be called the cultivation station. Um, it'll have a pack shed where we're washing and packing produce. And then there will be an education room that could be rented out by master gardeners and others. Um, with a really big garage store, so if it's a nice day, you can have an indoor outdoor event, classroom space. It's a concrete floor with a drain, so if you want to get it dirty and power wash it down, that's what it's designed for. Um, uh, Grow Johns County has a large uh, 30 by 96 greenhouse out there that we rent out space in as well, but that's where we're growing about, I would say, 50,000 transplants each year for the operation. But the main mission of our program is to <clears throat> kind of improve healthy food access for the community, um, the insecure, food insecure residents within Johnson County, and then also help provide education to the next generation of food producers, which typically do not come from a farm background. So we're teaching very basic skills. Um, and at the end of the year, when they get to sit on a tractor, it's like the best day of their life, so. <laughs> The history of uh, the program, Grow Johns County, is actually primarily founded by a uh, good friend, uh, John Bowler and Scott Kepke. Uh, John is the director of the Corval Food Pantry. John was like, I want to have more fresh product in our pantry instead of like the you know shelf stable foods. Um, but we also don't want to like get the secondhand food that comes like brown bananas from High V or something. So is there a way that we could grow it? And at that time, Johnson County was actually just putting out a request for proposals from organizations to use the farm for some purpose. Since about the 1970s, the farm had just been rented out um, to a, a land tenant that was primarily just in row crop production. So in 2015 was actually uh, the first year that we didn't grow a uh, food crop, but we grew cover crops on the first two acres that the county designated uh, to the program, the Grow Johnson County program. And then in 2016 is when um, I led kind of the, the first gr uh, growing season. It was on that first two acres. I think we distributed about 11,000 pounds worth of food that first year. Um, I was actually bringing most of my equipment from home um, to do that. And then um, today we're pretty self uh, sufficient uh, the program is on its own equipment base um, as well. 2016 or 2017 we expanded to four acres. 2019 uh, we built a large greenhouse. We're actually working with Kirkwood Community College growing all of our transplants in the greenhouses on campus in Cedar Rapids. We learned really quick that you can't transplant, transport transplants easily. They don't stack. Um, mm -hmm. So we, Wellmark Foundation gave us a grant 
and we put up this large greenhouse, and now we're a lot more efficient um, on, on our transplant production. And then 2020, uh, we expanded to five acres. Um, this year, we'll actually be closer to almost six acres, um, approximately. Some basic, yeah, how we're using the greenhouse. So, yeah, we primarily grow all of our transplants. Uh, we used to buy all of our onions from Texas from bare root transplants, which are very expensive. Um, so now we're on our third year of do growing our own onions. And so we're just about done seeding about our 20,000 onions that we're planting here as soon as in early April. Um, and then, yeah, we use a greenhouse also to cure onions and winter squash. And then we grow tomatoes and basil. So these are when tomatoes and the basil were pretty young yet last summer. Uh, and we didn't actually have a good slide of this, but we have an apprenticeship program. So we we have typically two to four paid apprentices that operate kind of from middle of May until the end of the season when we can't be there anymore. It's just too cold to do anything. And so this is a Luna, one of our apprentices, uh, last summer harvesting. So we're very, like I said, we're growing this food for the, for the community. Um, and we want to be conscious about what foods we're growing. Um, we, we originally did a lot of surveys with all the pantries and meal programs within Johnson County. And they told us things not to grow like every gardener is bringing the baseball size zucchinis their extra tomatoes like don't grow any don't grow any zucchini the first year i grew to <laughs> cucumbers and they told me to stop because i was bringing too many cucumbers and they already got um but what we felt like we're asking the the staff at the pantries the people that were stocking the shelves they weren't the ones actually eating the food so we really believe in what some people use the term of food sovereignty, so people having the right to choose the food that they're uh, getting from the pantries. Even though they're going to the pantry to get food when they need it, they should still have the choice of the food that they get and not just what's there. Um, so in 2020, we implemented, I guess we called it a pilot then, but we, we were trying to in, in, implement a new system. So we called uh, this Voice Your Choice. So I think we have three of these stands. This is an iPad um, that we, we move these around to all of our partners, primarily from like December through January, February. We still have uh, one of these out, uh, I can't remember where. Um, so when uh, clients are going to these service providers, they're filling out this survey. 2020, we had our first uh, response of 165 people took this while they're getting services at the agencies. Um, and then this year, we're actually establishing what's called a community advisory board. So these will be actually 10 individuals that are represented across these partners that are actually the individuals that are coming to receive food or other types of assistance, not staff from these organizations. They're going to be the ones that are telling us, like, grow more of this. Can you distribute this? Like, what about prepared foods? Like, should we do some other style of distribution model? Um, because we want the feedback from the people that are actually eating the food, the families. We also believe that you should be able to respond to these questions in the native language that you speak. We have a very diverse community in the county, so uh, there are seven languages that this survey can be taken in. It's three questions. It's also, if you're not super, um, uh, I think of the word, literate. yeah, literate, um, it's all pictures as well, so everything's translated. This is just how we understand what people want us to grow more of, what are the, the highest, um, the foods that are in the highest demand. So it's like uh, me as a commercial operation, I'm talking to my customers, like what do they want me to grow, how much quantities. These clients are our customers, our Grow Johnson County customers. So the top five things that are requested are watermelon, who else wouldn't want watermelon though? <laughs> um, carrots, onions, bell peppers, broccoli, potatoes are really high on that list as well. And so all of that, all this information informs our crop plan. So Claire uh, kind of, you probably started working that already back in November, 
but we have giant, a lot of spreadsheets that we're going to grow this here, this there. We're going to plant this number of transplants, but this kind of information tells us how much of that to do and how much we shouldn't do. Yeah, so so far this year we've had 246 responses from this system. Turn it over to Claire to talk about how it all happens on the farm. Okay. So I have started the management of the crop planning and will be telling people what to do as we go through the season. It's a pretty fun job. Um, I haven't managed a farm before, but I have worked on organic vegetable operations for eight years before this, so I'm just kind of channeling that knowledge into a managerial position on it. Um, but at GROW, it's important to us that we are providing good quality food to our clients, and part of that means that we're not using chemicals and we're using methods that are sustainable in the long term on the land. So part of how we do that uh, is creating habitat in less productive areas of the farm. So instead of just tilling it all up and planting everything we can, we are implementing other strategies. So we have three beetle banks, which provide habitat for beneficial ground beetles. So these are just long strips that go along in different areas of where we have our fields laid out so that we have habitat close by where we're growing our crops. So a couple examples of those would be lady beetles and soldier beetles, which are, uh, they hunt the other things that we don't want to be seeing in the field as much. We also have, as Jason mentioned, a 15 acre prairie reconstruction, and that serves as a habitat again for pollinators and also some of these beneficial beetles. And that helps us out because bees are necessary to keep growing crops. So we want to have a home for them nearby. We also interplant some flowers into our crop rows so that you know the pollinator meadow is close by, but these flowers are even closer and bring the bees in and, and help us that way. And they're really pretty to look at, so it, it helps our quality of life out there as we're pulling weeds and, and doing other activities in the field. And then this year we're going to add a bat house. I don't know where we're going to put that yet, but we will have a little habitat for the little brown bat, which is a, an endangered species. We also try to reduce erosion by keeping the soil covered as much as possible. So 90% of all of our crop fields are planted to cover crop. You know, it varies a little bit from year to year because if it gets, if it's too wet at the end of the season or the, you know, the timing doesn't work out with the weather, we can't always get the crop planted, but we try our best. We also use leftover city leaf mulch. They bring it out to the property and we spread that in any field that we can just to add more organic matter and to keep everything covered. Uh, we use it in our garlic field actually to, as just a very thick mulch, maybe four to six inches of it, so it's pretty, pretty thickly spread on there. We also keep all of our fields in the same position each year, so we have permanent driveways and walkways between them, so that grass stays there and serves as a, a place where filtration into the soil can happen and we're not increasing compaction in our fields more than we need to because we're driving next to them where we're trying to grow our crops. So I wanted to talk a little bit about organic vegetable production. We have five acres or actually more like six acres this year and what that means to us is that we're farming in a way that nourishes the land, ecosystems, our neighbors, and our community. And part of how we do that is with integrated pest management. So in this approach to pest management, the first step is to create prevention methods through uh, supporting an ecological uh, system. So we have the prairie, the beetle banks, other methods would be to use trap crops, so you're planting something that is a little more desirable to your pests, and then they'll go to that first and maybe leave your, your desired crop alone. We also use rotation, so we try to reduce disease and pests by, we grow a certain type of crop in one area, and then we try to move it as far away as we can the next season, or for a three to five year period, depending on how much space you have just to remove the food source for those pests. We also 
at the, as a last resort, so part of uh, integrated pest management is you do all that stuff first, and it's going to take care of a large portion of your problems, but then as a last resort, we can use organic approved pesticides. So those are different than your average pesticides because they are not petroleum based. And uh, organic pesticides tend to be naturally derived and they don't last as long in the environment. So they'll break down within 12 to 24 hours, whereas the petroleum based products will be around for a long, long time. We also don't use synthetic fertilizers. Um, the issue with those is that a lot of farmers put too much of those in the field and then the rain comes and can wash it down into the surface waters or it doesn't, or it filters down through the soil profile into the groundwater if there's just too much for the soil to hold. So we avoid those. Weed control in organic production is a pretty sore point. It's, it's a lot of work. <laughs> Uh, a lot of it's just going in there and hand pulling, but that's not very efficient for five, six plus acres. So a pretty common method is tillage. It is effective if you time it correctly, and there's something called stale bedding where if you till the, fir the top inch or two of soil right before you're going to plant, then you've killed that first flush of weeds, and then you have less uh, stress against your crop when you're planting but it's very destructive. We also can use plastic mulch and that has its pros and cons. One of the big cons is that you have to throw it away at the end of the year unless you're really careful about not letting it get holes in it, which is very difficult. And then also cultivation is a method. So we have tractors and equipment that we use for this to make it go faster. But again, as things are growing to a certain point, they get too tall, but while they're early in their, in their growing stage, you can go through with some teeth, uh, metal, metal teeth that go through and just kind of scrape off those weeds uh, as close as you can to your crop without destroying it, but accidents happen. Uh, <laughs> we are starting to move a little bit into no-till because it has a lot of benefits for soil health. Um, and we had a pretty success, successful experiment last year with two fields. Although we learned that if you plant vetch uh, and, and don't get it killed in the spring, it'll come back and compete pretty strongly with the crops. So we won't be using that again in our mix, but rye has been a very successful uh, cover crop. So cover crops are pretty important. They can serve as weed control, so if you get that nice big thick crop of of cover crop, then the weeds don't have a chance because the sunlight is blocked from these um, cover crops and they take up the nutrients and water that the weeds would use. It also provides, depending on the crop you plant, some nutrient management. So there are two types of cover crops essentially that's legumes and non-legumes. So legumes are like soybeans, peas, things that fix nitrogen in the soil so they would put nitrogen back into your soil and then uh, non-legumes will take it back out and store it in their organic matter and then slowly release it so that your plants can then use it later. So we try to keep a good mix of those and so that we're having nutrients available when we need them and that is uh, important for soil health as well as uh, the roots growing down in the cover crops can increase the um, pore space in the soil so there's more room for oxygen and water and nutrient storage that is available then to your plants. So it all, it's all very complicated and all works together all at the same time and so it's hard to, it's hard to manage it but you just do your best. And, uh, uh, you had mentioned my, my thesis project was about the online tools that are available for farmers who wonder what should I plant? Uh, how do I get rid of it when I not, don't want it in the field anymore? You know, all those questions that they seem very big, but if you zero in on what your goal is, it becomes a little easier. Oh, and then this cartoon, I found this a few years ago. And it's uh, from Underdone <laughs> Comics, but yeah, that's, I feel that. <laughs> that's our arch nemesis, the kind yes. of color on the potato beetle. So 
So here we have a list of the major tools that we use on the farm. So we have a nice John Deere tractor that's it's newer, um, so it's, it's reliable. It's important that it starts when we get there in the morning and not two hours later when we've messed around with it. Uh, we also have an international 656 tractor. That one's a little less reliable, but it's, it's all right. It does the job eventually. Um, and then the case 256, we have a belly mounted cultivator set up on this one. So that's the one we're running through the fields as we go um, to get rid of some of those weeds, as many as possible, because if we don't get them with the cultivator, then we have to go and hand weed them. And that just takes forever, <laughs> so we don't want to do that. Um, we also have a BCS. What does that stand for again? I don't know. No, it's an Italian company, but uh, it's, it's specialized for small scale horticulture uh, applications. But we use that, it's, it's a walk behind tractor, so it's like um, this big and you just kind of walk behind it like a lawnmower, but it's a little heftier than that. And then this year we're going to try a new kind of walk behind tractor for cultivation. So it'll have an attachment on the back that has um, the cultivator teeth on it so that we can do that on a more quick paced, smaller scale without having to get the tractor up because there are only so many of us who can drive the tractor safely. <laughs> uh, some implements that we use, we have a seven foot rototiller. That's, you know, it's the most destructive tillage, but it is necessary when you can't do all those other steps ahead. And it creates a good soil bed for transplants. So the picture we have here, that's been tilled with the rototiller, and then so it's, it's a nice soft place to put the seedlings into. We also have tine weeders, finger weeders. Um, so finger weeders, I wish we would put a picture on there, but it's just a little, a little wheel of of like fingers that are rubbery and um, they, they spin quickly through the soil and they're a little gentler but they they just pick off the little weeds that are right up close to the plant without cutting think, into the soil. Think of two sets of uh, spider like wheels that have fingers on them and they rotate on the ground so your plants are going right here between these little fingers so these fingers are actually pushing around the stems of your plants and there's little tiny weeds that have just germinated it's pushing those out but it's not pulling your plants out your crop out. It can be scary for newbies <laughs> to do that. Uh, water wheel transplanter, that we do have pictured here. So we don't use the water tanks, but you could fill them up and have them draining water as you go, just to give those plants a water at, right as you put them in. But we just set up our um, tape, uh, drip tape irrigation pretty quickly after to get the water on those. Um, and it's, it's pretty cozy. You sit on seats behind and just kind of pull out of your trays and put it into the hole as you go. It, it's, uh, it's not too bad. We also have a potato digger that attaches behind the tractor and that um, it cuts under right under the potatoes and then pushes them up onto a conveyor that shakes some of the dirt and, and other debris off and then lays them up on the, on the top of the ground so you can just walk along and pick them up. We also have a subsoiler. Um, that one is more for if a field does get compacted you can, it, it cuts pretty deeply, you know, a few feet down just to bring, uh, loosen that soil up. And then we also have an undercutter that we use for carrots where you know, they're a foot or a foot and a half below the ground. So we just try to set it right so you're not cutting the carrots off, which is also kind of hard, but just kind of pull it along and it lifts the carrots up just a little bit so they can be shaken out of the ground. But we, we need all this stuff because we have a pretty large scale operation that if we tried to go and take our, our forks and dig in to the ground every time we had, it would just take way too long. Um, we also use uh, drill and broadcast seeders for cover crop application and a roller crimper, which again, I wish we would have had a picture of this too, but uh, it's a big cylinder with V-shaped ridges on it. And as you drag it along, or as you pull it along behind the tractor, it knocks the cover crop over and then kind of crimps it at the base so that it kills, hopefully, the plant uh, that you don't want um, taking up nutrients anymore. A few of the tools, we have a John Deere Gator, which is just a little ATV that we carry stuff around in. It's a lot quicker than walking in a lot of cases, sometimes not. Um, and then we have large walk-in coolers to store all of this product so that um, it's as fresh as it can be and, and doesn't look wilty when we get it to the clients. 
we have a produce washer that's pretty new this year we had and that's a conveyor system where you put the dirty product in one end and it comes out the other end mostly clean it depends on what it is uh, it might need another round but it saves a lot of time for us as well and then we have various cedars um, smaller scales like in the greenhouse we'll just have a little uh, it's like a two-wheel thing that we just push along to get some seeds in the ground. And then the good old wheel hose and stirrup hose for when everything else has failed. We can just go out there and do it by hand. <laughs> so volunteering. Uh, it's critical to what we do. We have a small team and some, like the early stages, planting, we can maybe get done by ourselves, but when it comes to the harvest and Getting everything done all at the same time in June, July, August, September, it would be a lot. So we are very thankful that we have volunteers come out to the farm. And many of them have told us that it's a great chance for fresh air and exercise in a time when it is sorely needed. So we try to keep everybody safe. And we do that with frequent hand washing, daily cleaning practices of surfaces that are frequently touched. And that's for you know, not only pandemic related things, but also food safety in general. And as you heard, Jason and I are both food safety auditors, so we have an eagle eye for that sort of thing, trying to keep everything clean and reduce the chance that it could be contaminated with some uh, microorganisms. So during the pandemic, we found a model that really works for us. So it used to be more just show up when you want to and, and that'll be fine. But uh, it was really nice to have people who regularly showed up and committed to 10 to 15 hours a week, Monday, Wednesday, Fridays in the morning, eight to noon are our distribution times every week during the summer. So it's pretty important that we have help during that time, but there are a few other things to do here and there. And you know, in 2020, volunteers spent 908 total hours at the farm. And then in 2021, we upped that a little bit more into 989. So I'll put a plug in right now. If you are interested in coming on volunteering, we'd love to see you there. Or if you know anyone else who's been saying, I just need to get outside and do something, they can come and see us. So a little bit of a, a snapshot into production. So you had said 11,000 for the first year of production. Well, now we've brought it all the way up to 32,820 pounds of fresh produce provided to all of our 15 partner agencies last year. And you can see some, by the numbers things, we grew uh, almost 8,000 pounds of potatoes. We had quite a bit of squash, onions, pumpkins, and garlic cured in our greenhouse, and a lot of watermelon and carrots. So we tried to really uh, ramp up those crops that were uh, requested by our clients and many different vegetable varieties. It would take a long time to name them, so I'm not going to, but it's almost everything you can think of minus the things that the pantries are getting too much of. So these are some of our partners. Actually, I hope it's all of them, might be all of them. So table to table is pretty important. They come and pick up things from us uh, every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and then take that to where it needs to go. So they're a uh, yeah, pretty strong, critical partner. And then, of course, everybody that we distribute to, um, we try to get everyone's voices involved and, and send what is needed when it's needed. Uh, it, it's a work in progress. We're trying to you know, send too much of one thing one week, and then, OK, well, we didn't want that much, so we'll, we'll try to adjust that. But every, every season, we get a little better at it. Do you want to take over sure. sponsors? Okay. Yeah, and related to partners, I didn't really hit on it very well, but um, Table Table, I'm assuming everyone's pretty familiar with uh, them here in Johnson County. They're our, dis our distribution partner. Almost all of our partner agencies come to the, f or receive our product through Table to Table. They're Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, they come and pick it up, and then they go on a route and drop off at the agencies on a on a different schedule depending on which day of the week but like open heartland or the hills community food pantry they come to us and pick up their own um their own product but we wouldn't be able to do most of this without table to table but so i just want to make sure they get the credit for all the work and some of you may be even drivers for table to table too so thank you as well 
Um, so how we, we've done uh, all this work, so we started with, uh, I think we had a grant from Wellmark Foundation in the first year as well that helped pay some of my time for the production in the first year, but since then it's been through donors, corporate funders, uh, foundation grants, um, and we also have some other federal um, grants as well. But, you know, so Johnson County rents the land to us a uh, dollar a year, um, which sadly they've never even sent me that invoice for the dollar. Um, but uh, so that's a huge staple thing, it's just the land access for the program. But they do also provide, um, it's typically around $25,000 to help pay for our operations for the program as well each year. But over the years, we've had fun grant, um, grants from the United Natural Food, Incorporated Foundation, uh, Wellmark Foundation, I mentioned already. Eat the Change, uh, it's connected a couple large natural food companies, and that foundation actually bought the equipment to for our no-till production model that we're trialing and trying to do more of, so that roller crimper that Claire mentioned. Uh, the Green State Credit Union, General, General Mills, um, they give us about $20,000 each year, um, so their employees in Cedar Rapids choose the program um, to fund it. Mid-American is uh, almost every year uh, has been uh, helping pay for fuel. You know, we have about 2000 I think it was about 1500 to $2,000 last year we spent on diesel and gas for our equipment. So that is a big foundation. Uh, Community Foundation of Johnson County has helped fund like a lot of that voice your choice work. City of Iowa City through their climate action grant helped pay for our, our potato digger. Tyson's has a foundation. Um, Principal Foundation has been a new funder. They just started funding some work last year. Uh, Colono Supernatural has always been funding uh, just like input, seed, potting soil. And then Pyramid Services. Uh, we, uh, they really helped us out when we were buying our newer John Deere tractor by donating a, a pallet fork to go on the tractor that we can move produce around by pallets versus by back loads. Um, so it's really been a game changer when, as we scale up to be more efficient on that. Um, one uh, system we started uh, two years ago was a sponsorship program. So individuals and uh, companies have been sponsoring the program at these different uh, levels. So um, if you're ever out at the farm, you'll see these uh, magnetic decals that are on our equipment, like our implements or the individual tractors of the companies or individuals that have funded uh, those things. Or people that have just like, you know, we, uh, we have, so we helped about 15 farms across Iowa get a, a load of potting soil that we all really love from Vermont. Well, it's a long ways away, but we really like this product. Um, it's supreme, but it was cheaper if we bought a whole semi-load. So we have a whole semi-load of potting soil coming next week. So we have, just for our own program, we spend about $2,500 on potting soil. So just $500 goes a long way to help pay for that cost. Um, and I think our seed costs, I mean, our seed this year will have um, close to an acre of potatoes, and that seed is gonna cost us about $1,500 just for the potato crop, so, um, as well. And Claire's busy ordering se seed at least almost every week, it seems like, still. Hopefully it's one again. <laughs> yeah. I wanted, uh, before we kind of turn into questions here, I wanted also to mention, um, you're the lucky ones. This is not really the, the real, pre-version, but this is like fresh off the press of our annual report for the program that we'll be um, getting back uh, from the printer next week that'll go to the public, but I brought a bunch of copies um, for anyone that would like a copy of that as well. Um, we highlight a lot of the stuff that Claire and I have talked about, but there is a really great uh, case study of the no-till production work that we've been doing in here, and you can really see, so we had a a uh, quarter acre field that was that has not had any kind of tillage on it for more than 365 days and it's had some kind of growing uh, plant in that field since that time too. Um, so there's a little uh, case study of that if you're interested. But if you want to just see more about the program, we do a really good job. I have to uh, give our staff member Julia a lot of credit for social media work that she does. 
except for the reels on Instagram that she's started to make us all do. Um, Bonnie would know that really well because she got suckered into it. <laughs> Um, but we have really good social media on Instagram and Facebook. If you just want to see what we're doing or see the people that are doing the work um, as well. And our website is a great place, especially if you would know someone that's interested in our apprenticeship program where applications are due at the end of the month, right? Yeah. Um, so it's a 20 hour per week position with um, classroom, kind of on farm classroom and then on farm hands on education as well. So. Um, and then this is a picture of one of our summer cover crops. Um, this is sorghum sedan grass, cow peas, and sun hemp all mixed together. Sorghum sedan grass smothers out anything that's below it because it grows so fast and gets so tall and thick. Cow peas is producing nitrogen and so is sun hemp um, for the next year's crop. So that field, uh, not exactly that one, but that field um, is going to be onions um, this year where we had that cover crop last summer and uh, also a little bit of garlic. So it's producing the nitrogen for that next crop. So we're not putting any kind of synthetic nitrogen on top of that field. Yeah, we'll open up to questions now. So Jason, it sounds like you basically fertilize the soil using cover crops, leaf mulch, anything else? Uh, and then uh, we use some, some form of compost. Um, we prefer like a manure-based compost that is either is made from like uh, dairy cattle manure or other type of manure that's been composted. Where does that come from? Um, we've got it from a diff couple different sources. Uh, Cowsmo is a company in Wisconsin. Uh, okay. This year I needed to fill a couple more pallets on this truckload. That's, so it's uh, compost that's coming from Vermont. Um, we use some of the city of Iowa City compost, but there's not manure in it. And I really like a manure-based compost versus a, just an organics-based compost with leaf mulch and wood and stuff like that. Right. Um, and then we also use... Um, not every year and not on every field, but uh, pelletized chicken manure that has been heated and treated so that it's safe, doesn't have any kind of foodborne pathogens that would contaminate our crops, but also it's a stable form in 50 pound bags that we can put in the broadcast seeder and broadcast on a field and then work it in. So it's just a granular product. Okay. Yep. How do you heat the greenhouse? So we have a propane heater in that, um, yep. And just what variety of onions do you plant? I'm just curious. Claire's busy on that. I'll let her answer that question. We'll <laughs> see if I can remember them all. Um, we This year we've got Sierra Blanca, which is a, a white large bulb onion that it doesn't store very long, but it, it's more a sweet variety. Um, we have Expression, New York Early, Rosa di Milano, which sounds very exotic, but uh, uh, blush and amber. We're trying amber this year, but um, yeah, some of those we know, like Sierra Blanca performs well, New York Early performs well. Uh, we try to keep a mix of yellow, white, and pink, red onions. And, and what's your rotation cycle like? I know you try to rotate. Do you have a specific system that you use, or in terms of rotating crops and not exact science. Um, I think the biggest thing that we're trying to get the biggest span in years from field to field is our, so there's the brassica family, so cauliflower, broccoli, kale, collards, all that. There's a lot of diseases that can be like fungal diseases um, that can live in the soil. So if we can get three years to four years before that crop will come back there, that's our primary thing. Um, but like crop rotation, I mean, we're thinking fertility, but we're also thinking um, what was there prior so that, like, onions, I'm a little worried right now. We usually don't want to have a lot of biomass on top of that soil, um, but that's where we had that, this big cover crop, and I didn't get it worked into the soil last year, so it's so all sitting on top of the ground. Um, so I'm worried about getting that all worked in and, and chewed up a little bit before we plant those because otherwise... The worms are going to love all that biomass that I work in, in the soil, and they're also not going to know what's a piece of sorghum sedan grass cover crop and what's an onion. They're going to eat both of them if there's too much of that. So 
because um, we have a lot of earthworms because of the practices. There's pros and goods and, um, but yeah, we're also thinking of, uh, is it a spring crop and uh, can we, what kind of cover crop was there prior to that? Or if it's uh, uh, like the no-till fields, we don't plant our squash and our melons till about the big, middle of June. Um, Cause we like the cube, first flush of cucumber beetles and squash bugs to go somewhere, somewhere else, someone else's farm. And then we <laughs> plant those. So we didn't use any insecticide or pesticides on our squash and melons last year. Um, and we had a, more than almost three quarters of an acre of those crops. Um, but we have to time that with to making sure the right cover crop is in front of that so we can do the no-till thing. So um, it's mainly uh, around the crop. The crop rotation is really based on the season each crop family, but the brassica family is the one that we're trying to move the most. Yeah. And do you do a spring planting as well as a fall planting? Do you do a second fall planting? Yeah, we do multiple successions. So mm -hmm. um, we'll be, we do a big cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower crop, and then we do another cr planting in uh, late July, early August. Right. Um, I'm only doing cauliflower in the fall yeah. this year. It just, fall is a better time for cauliflower and red cabbage, I hear. So I'm doing, doing red cabbage in the fall as well. Yeah. Thank you. I love fall gardening because the weeds know not to grow anymore, the <laughs> bugs are going dormant or dying, and it's cooler. There's no insect problem in the fall. <laughs> it's, it's awesome, yeah. July is worse. <laughs> Thank you both very much. You have great graphics, by the way. Grove Johnson County does. I've been watching you. Oh, yeah. I want to thank everyone for coming and remind you that we have a plant sale coming up in uh, May. And if you have any time to volunteer, please get a hold of Emil Rendersbacher. Um, our seed share is not going to happen as it has in past years. Past years, we've had over a thousand seed packets donated to us. This year, because of the pandemic, most of the um, proprietary seed companies have donated their seeds to community gardens. Uh, we only received about 130 seed packets. We do have some bulk seed available for tomatoes, um, peppers, some cabbages. So if you're looking for seeds to grow, for the plant sale, um, let me know. Let me know what you want, and we'll get them to you. So, again, thank you for coming. Thank you very much, and thanks to all of our speakers. Couldn't do it without you.